We are on the record. This is the digital video deposition of Dr. Michael Riley, testifying in the matter of Raylene Stokes versus County of Orange et al. in the Superior Court of the State of California, County of Orange, case number 30-2010-0035-13398. This deposition is being held at 402 North Nevada Street, Oceanside, California. Today is Monday, October 29th, 2012, Time is now 10.09 a.m. My name is Greg Eisman, legal video specialist with Jordan Media Incorporated, 1228 Madison Avenue in San Diego, California. The certified shorthand reporter today is Maggie Smith in association with Crom Court Reporting, San Diego, California. All counsel will now state their appearances for the record. John McMillan appearing for plaintiffs. Pat Desmond appearing for the County of Orange, the deponent Dr. Riley, and the other social workers that have been sued in this lawsuit. Would the reporter please swear the witness? If you would, doctor, please raise your right <coughs> hand to be administered the oath. Do you solemnly state under penalty of perjury the testimony you give in this matter shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Riley, can you please state and spell your full name, including your middle name for us? Sure. Michael Levon, L-A, capital V-O-N, Riley, R-I-L-E-Y. And Mr. Riley, what position do you currently hold with the County of Orange? I am the Director of Social Services Agency of Orange County. And as Director of the entire agency, you oversee all departments, correct? Yes, I do all four departments and approximately 4,000 employees. Okay, I'm going to show you what we'll mark as Exhibit number 133 to your deposition. <clears throat> have you had a moment to review that exhibit number 133? Yes, I have. It says in the upper right hand corner that as of July 10th, 2012, that was a current organizational chart, correct? Yes. Is that still current? There have been some changes since that time. Okay, can you do me a favor and I will hand you one of my pens, actually sure. my only pen, okay. and ask you if you would to go ahead and interlineate the changes? Sure. change and Nancy Davis and the CalWORKS program has retired. Okay. And she was replaced? She was, she was a deputy director for our CalWORKS program under Nathan Nishimoto. Okay. And she has been replaced, correct? She has not been replaced. They're so it's an, an open? It's vacant right now. They're interviewing okay. probably as we speak. Just so that I'm clear, and I'll give this back to you. I have a copy for okay. myself. Thanks. Just so that I'm clear as to the organization of the agency, it looks like there are four basic departments, correct? Yes. And one of those departments is Children and Family Services, correct? That's correct. And the division director is Gary Taylor? That's right. Okay. If you could, I was looking at one of the documents you brought with you here today, and it's titled uh, County of Orange Social Services Agency Program Mandates and Best Practices. Mm -hmm. I want to make sure I read this correctly, but am I correct that the funding for your programs, 13% of it is devoted to children and family services? Of the, you mean an SSA total budget? Yes. Yes. Okay. And approximately 90% of that budget comes from federal and state funding, correct? That's correct. How much is that? It's vague as to time. 
Well, how much was it this year? I'm not certain as far as because we get there's several funding sources that flow into the to our CFS budget. There is child welfare service budget. There is a foster care budget, which primarily covers the uh, which is under Title IV E, which covers actually group home placement and foster care placement, which that money flows through us out to the providers. Mm -hmm. The Child Welfare Services Program is the one that pays for our overhead for our social workers. Mm -hmm. And that's usually somewhere around 80, 85 million, somewhere around in there, roughly. I'm not certain offhand. Um, and then we also have mon monies coming in for Adoption Services Program, which is different, and our um, AB 12, which is just passed this year, which is for our emancipated youth to carry them through the age of 21. So there's several funding sources that, we, okay. that flow into CFS. Okay. Let's start with uh, the Social Services Agency total budget for 2012. What was that total budget? The total budget for 2000, for operating budget is about $875 million. Is there some other kind of budget besides the operating budget? Yes, our total budget is about $2.1, $2.2 billion. That includes public assistance payments okay. for Medi-Cal and CalFresh. Okay. And just so that I'm clear, County of Orange Social Services Agency total budget for 2012 was $2.2 billion, correct? About, that's about, yeah, about that. And of that $2.2 billion, approximately 13% of that went to Children and Family Services, correct? Actually, 13% would come from the operating budget, which is not the total, because that $2.2 billion, $2 billion, that's mm -hmm. on top of the operating budget, and that primarily flows primarily through our public assistance programs. Some of that would be foster care, because some of that is supporting foster parents and okay. relative caregivers, but I don't have the exact breakout for that. So am I correct that in this uh, program mandates and best practices document that you produced here today for 2012, when you're talking about the funding being 13% of the total funding for it's, County of Orange Social Services Agency, are we talking about it being 13% of the operating budget or 13% of the total budget? 13% of the operating budget. Okay. Can you show me where on this document it says that? Relax Foundation. It doesn't say that here. Okay. That is a document you produced here uh, with you for your deposition today, mm -hmm. correct? That's mm -hmm. a yes? Yes. Okay. Did you review that document before you came to give your deposition here today? Yes, I did. Okay. Did you participate in any way in preparing that document? Not in, pre not in preparing the document, no, I didn't. I reviewed it, but I didn't prepare it. Okay. You reviewed it for accuracy before it was finalized, correct? Yes, I did. Okay, and you found it to be accurate? Yes, I did. However, I did not see that 13% as the total budget. I was just looking at it as operating budget. And another thing you'd said a little earlier is that the total budget, that $2.2 .2 billion number, was on top of the $875 million operating budget. Did you mean that it's in addition to, so we aggregate the two numbers? It's, um, yeah, it's, you aggregate the two numbers, so you would separate out the 875, 878 million from that 2.2 .2 billion dollars, subtract that from the, that's all inclusive, total 2.1, 2.2 billion, including the operating budget. Okay. Okay, so if we pull out the 875 million mm -hmm. from the 2.2 .2 billion, mm -hmm. whatever's left would be that portion of the total budget that is not devoted to children and family services. That's correct. Okay. So am I correct that roughly 40% of your total budget goes to children and family services? That misstates the evidence. Well, what's 875, or yeah, 2.2 .2 billion divided by 875 million. That 
that it, that's the total operating budget for SSA, not for Children and Family Services. Eight hundred seventy-five million. Okay, the eight hundred seventy-five million that is the total SSA operating budget. Okay. Which covers our overhead and facilities and maintenance and day-to-day -day expenses for the most part. So where does the other $1.4 billion go? The other goes to our, we are flow-through, it goes to our citizens for Medi-Cal, CalFresh, in-home supportive services, refugee services. So that would be the, uh, if I were to number mm -hmm. on... Exhibit 133. In fact, let's just go ahead and do that. If you can number one through four, the different divisions. Okay. Number one is administrative division. Number two is adult services and assistance programs. That's where we have, again, most of our Medi-Cal programs and CalFresh programs. CalFresh, by the way, is a new name for yeah, food for stamps. Yeah, for the food stamps. I saw California, that. yeah. Got to do some rebranding. Right. And then Division Three is Children and Family Services, and Division Four is Family Self-Sufficiency, which houses CalWORKs and Welfare to Work programs. Now, administrative services. Yes. That's a basic overhead function, right? That's essentially. That's, that's essentially what you have in place to keep all the programs correct managed and running. Correct. Okay. One thing you have to do is try to wait for me to finish the question because she's trying to write down everything you say. <laughs> and then adult services, that's a separate program where you're essentially, or the county is essentially um, providing services to adults who need help, right? Yes. And the administrative services division, some of those people actually provide the logistical support and infrastructure to manage that program, correct? Yes. And it's the same with regard to CalWORKs family uh, self-sufficiency? Yes. So the administrative services provide the infrastructure and logistical support to operate the family self-sufficiency division? Yes. And it's also the same with regard to children and family services, correct? Yes. That is that the administrative services division provides logistical support and infrastructure to operate the children and family services unit. Yes. How does the administrative services division divide or rather derive its operating budget? It derives its operating budget for what we call cost applies. For example, for the services that they may, an HR staff person who's, say, working with uh, adult assistance programs, who's doing some, working on some personnel issue, that cost is cost applied to the adult services program, which has a completely different funding source. So therefore, any services or support they provide to these other three divisions is cost applied to these other three divisions' budget. Okay, and by they you mean the administrative services staff, right? Yes. So to the extent that the administrative services division provides either logistical support, staff, or infrastructure support to one of these other divisions, there will be a charge somewhere so, against that division. Right. With the exception, perhaps, of the um, our IT, because we have, uh, with our IT, our information uh, technology division, or section, I should say, oftentimes we'll get a, f a separate funding stream for them as well to support our all of our networks, Okay. which are cloud networks. Okay. And is that separate funding source also included in your total budget, which was for this year $2.2 Yes, it's included in all of that. Okay. Now, if we focus just for a moment on children and family services, mm -hmm. does it also have its own internal infrastructure or does it use the infrastructure provided by administrative services? It uses, for clarification purposes, 
we are one department. SSA is one department. Mm -hmm. These are divisions of that department. So the primary in infrastructure for these, for all of our divisions, is provided by the Administration Services Division. Okay. And then for budgeting purposes, the Administrative Service Division will keep track of which department is using which resources, and then there will be like a line item charge in that department's internal budget. Correct. Okay. Does each department have its own employees or does administrative services take care of all that in terms of infrastructure? Each department has its own employees. I don't have the exact, I used to know the exact number of each division, but with budget cuts kind of lost track. But roughly our adult services assistance programs is our biggest division. Mm -hmm. And they have roughly around 1,300 staff. Can you do me a favor and write down just under uh, or next to it there somewhere 1,300 around staff? Around 1,300. Okay. And then Children and Family Services is probably around uh, 1,000 or 1,100, somewhere around there. Mm -hmm. And then our, um, and then actually our smallest division is admin. But then the uh, CalWORKs division is probably around 800 or so. Roughly. Okay. And the admin has how many? Admin. Um, Just a rough estimate. It's fine. Okay. Probably <clears throat> around seven or eight hundred, somewhere around there. Somewhere in there to be exact. I didn't. Sure. Sure. No, I understand. Mm Now the adult services and assistance programs, which their funding also comes from state and federal funding, correct? Yes, predominantly state and federal funding. Probably only about 8% of that division's funding is net county cost. Okay. Is that also the same for children and family services? Most of that is from st uh, federal and state funding? The majority is, yes it is, but, but the uh, net county for children and family services is, is more than 8%. It ranges anywhere between 15 to 30% depending on the service and program provided. Okay. With regard, and let's just focus for a moment specifically on um, Well, let me ask you this first. Internally to Children and Family Services, I see there's four boxes under that division. Yes. Can you briefly describe for me uh, what Intervention and Prevention Services does? Intervention and Prevention Services is our front end programs. They, for the most part, do the emergency response, the child abuse registry, and um, they provide all the sort of the family, what we call our voluntary family services program. These are families that are served outside of the dependency system that we refer with. Also, they oversee our differential response, which are fam families we defer out so that we don't have to bring them into the system. Also, it's over our, what we call our Family Resource Centers Network, which is our FAC program. Um, so if you think about prevention and early intervention, that's primarily where all of that happens. Okay, so emergency response workers, they would be under intervention and prevention services. That's where they are. Okay, what about the investigators that come later? What division are they under? The um, investigators, for the most part, come under what we call our Family Assessment and Shelter Services Program. And that, they come with, that's our dependency investigation team, and they are attached, not attached, but they're in the same shell, uh, umbrella as our Orangewood Children and Families Shelter. Okay, can I get my pen just for a oh, second? Sure. Sorry. So Orangewood, the funding for Orangewood also would come under Family Assessment and Shelter Services. Mm -hmm. okay. Do you know off the top of your head just an estimate what the annual funding for Orangewood Children's Home is? Yeah, it's approximately $20 million. And just for foundational purposes, what is Orangewood Children's Home? 
Orange Wood Children and Family Service uh, Family Center is our emergency shelter for children who are removed into protective custody and where law enforcement bring kids that they find um, in harm's way. In harm's way? What do you mean by harm's way? When they do a drug raid, for example, and their kids in the home, or when they uh, are involved with domestic violence and there are kids there, and they will oftentimes, actually oftentimes they call us and we meet them on site. Mm -hmm. And then on site, the uh, would that be an ER worker, emergency response emergency worker? Emergency response worker. Mm -hmm. And then oftentimes on site, the emergency response worker will make an assessment of the safety of the child? Yes, we'll work in collaboration with law enforcement. Okay. And then oftentimes, there on the spot, the child will be removed from the home? Not necessarily. depends if the perpetrator is removed. What about when you don't know who the perpetrator was? When we don't know who the perpetrator is, then that's when we do a more thorough assessment. Before removing the child? Before removing the child. Now, hospital holds also treated from a, for a, from a legal perspective as a removal, correct? From a legal perspective, yes. And you do the same assessment there if you don't know who the perpetrator is or you can't figure out who the perpetrator was, you do a more thorough investigation before you remove the child? Yes, we do. We do that. And a lot has to do with the age of the child. Okay. Hold on one second. We'll get into that. What I'm really looking for right now is it's a more pointed question. You do the same assessment with regard to a hospital hold. If you know who the perpetrator is or you can't figure out, scratch that, let me start over. You do the same assessment with regard to a hospital hold. If you don't know who the per perpetrator is or you can't figure out who the perpetrator was, you do a more thorough investigation before you remove the child, correct? It's been asked and answered. I can clarify in regards to <coughs> using okay. destructive decision making model as far as if you want to say same, I would say consistent rather than same. Okay, let's, we'll get into the SDMs too. Let me get an answer to this question. With regard to a hospital hold, you treat that similarly as you would a removal from a home. If you don't know who the perpetrator is or you can't figure out who the perpetrator was, you do a more thorough investigation before you remove the child, correct? That, That's an answer. You can answer it again. Oh. That may be, again, it depends on the circumstances. Each circumstance is different. Um, we may, a hospital hold somewhat different circumstances than a investigating what's happening in the home with law enforcement right there and depending on what circumstances in that environment. Okay, let me go back to the original question. Maybe you've lost context and I'll read the whole line of questioning. It's really okay. a yes or no question. Okay. okay. It goes back to the question rel relative to what you meant by in harm's way. And my question was, in harm's way, what do you mean by in harm's way? Answer, when they do a drug raid, for example, and there are kids in the home, or when they're involved with domestic violence, and there are kids there, and they will oftentimes, actually oftentimes, they call us and we meet them on site. Question. And then on site, would that be an ER worker or emergency response worker? emergency response worker. Question. And then oftentimes on site, the emergency response worker will make an assessment of the safety of the child. Answer. Yes. We'll work in collaboration with law enforcement. Question. Okay. And then oftentimes, there, on the spot, the child will be removed from the home. Answer. Not necessarily. It depends if the perpetrator is removed. Question. What about when you don't know who the perpetrator was? Answer, when we don't know who the perpetrator is, that's when we do a more thorough assessment. Before removing the child? Answer, before removing the child. Now, a hospital hold is also treated from a legal perspective. This is my question. It's from a legal perspective as a removal, correct? Yes. That's an answer. 
Okay, the answer is yes. yes. And you do a similar assessment there. If you don't know who the perpetrator is, or you can't figure out who the perpetrator was, you do a more thorough investigation before you remove the child, correct? It's been asked and answered. For clarification purposes. Well, it, I'll, I'll clarify it once you answer the question. No, 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 no. If he can't answer it yes or no, he can answer it the way he's going to answer it. Can you tell me right now, can you answer that question yes or no? No. Okay. So a hospital hold then, correct me if I'm wrong, is treated differently from an in-home removal? Yes. Okay. Is that in all circumstances? It's overbroad. Not all circumstances, no. Each case is different and handled differently. Okay. Under what circumstances would a hospital hold, the placement of a hospital hold, be appropriate without conducting a further investigation? It's overbroad. When we do have, typically when we have a hospital hold, it's important to keep this in context that the hospital calls us because they feel as though there is potential, uh, there's explanation that has occurred, there has been no explanation for the, the injury of the infant or child, whatever the case may be. As a result, they call us and when it is a child under the age of three, and there is no explanation as to how the child was harmed, we do detain the child. Okay, and that's a matter of practice? That's a matter of practice when, the, when, when it's called for. Okay, and who decides whether or not there is an explanation for how the child was injured? Who makes that decision? We consult with all the physicians involved, the medical staff, if, if we can. Um, the at least we will we will discuss it with medical staff that's available, but really with our uh, child abuse expert, and we will make a determination. From there, the ER worker, in consultation with the his or her supervisor, they make that determination. Also in consult. So it's with law the emergency response worker. That's correct. Okay, and you said earlier that that before that decision's made, they'll conduct some kind of investigation. They will consult with and interview medical staff. So they will conduct some kind of investigation? Yes. Okay. And you, al you also said that as part of that investigation, they would speak with all the treating physicians? They will speak with the treating uh, physicians that they have access to. And in the best world they would speak with all treating physicians in in the best cases in the best of all worlds yes okay. and what happens if they're on the spot there's a conflict between the treating physicians as to the cause of the child's injuries it's vague and ambiguous and it's overbroad what we rely on is the advice from our child abuse experts. So if your child abuse expert is saying, yeah, this was abuse, but other treating physicians are saying, no, this is not abuse, you'll defer to the child abuse expert. Yes, we will. Okay. Even in areas where the child abuse expert has no acknowledged expertise in the particular area where the child's injured? It lacks foundation. That's not for us to determine. We don't know exactly who has the most knowledge in any particular area. We just know that our child abuse expert, who is a board certified child abuse expert, which there are very few of them here, in the state of California. Well, there's actually very oh, few oh, of them. You're, you're cutting him off. No, it's, not, it's a narrative response objection. And no, no, no. Let him finish his response. You can't cut him off. Yeah, I can. No, you can't. When it's a narrative response that's improper, no, 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 I can no. cut him off. You, you know that that would happen in court, too. I would object, narrative response, mm -hmm. that would be the end you of it. You can't cut him off, and we're not going to do that. All right, you can go ahead and continue your narrative response, unless you're done. There are very few board-certified child abuse experts in California. 
Okay, and the reason there are very few board certified child abuse experts in California is because only in 2011 did they start becoming board certified, correct? I don't know the exact date, but I know it's right. been very recent. Right. And in 2009, there was no such thing as a board certified child abuse expert, correct? That's my understanding. Okay. And in fact, in 2010, there was no such thing as a child abuse or a board certified child abuse expert. Again, that's my understanding. I don't know. Okay. So am I correct then that in 2009, we didn't have board certified child abuse experts, so you deferred, and by you I mean the agency, Orange County Social Services Agency, would defer to non-board certified so-called child abuse experts, correct? It's argumentative. We, we, we would respond to what we would consider experts, even though they may not have been board certified. Okay. And you would defer to that experts, so-called experts opinion over the opinion, for example, of a truly board-certified neurosurgeon, correct? It's argumentative, uh, and it, it's vague and ambiguous. It would depend on the circumstances. Okay. Now, currently, you are the head of Orange County Social Services Agency, correct? That's correct. You are the highest ranking member of the organization? Yes. And you have the authority to set policy for the entire department, correct? Yes. And that includes policies and practices for Children and Family Services Division, correct? Yes. And before you became the head of the entire agency, you were the head of the Children and Family Services Division. Before I was the Director of Social Services Agency, I was the Chief Deputy Director of Social Services Agency. Okay, and then at some point before that, you actually were the head of the Children and Family Services Division. That's correct. And when was that? That was from 1997 to to 2007. Okay. That would have been under Larry Lehman? Yes. Okay. And then later under Ingrid Harita? Yes. And the Social Services Children and Family Services Division, that's the only division of the agency that has the ability to remove children from the care of their parents? That's correct. And in fact, the Children and Family Services Unit does that frequently? It's big and ambiguous. They do that when it's necessary, yes. I don't know what frequently would be. Okay, you don't understand the word frequently? I understand frequently, but it's a matter of depending on the number of allegations we have and the investigations we have. We do it on a daily basis, if that's what you're asking. Yes, you remove children from the care of their parents on a daily basis. Yes, we do. Okay. And in most of those instances of removal, your social workers do not obtain a warrant prior to removing the child, correct? In most cases, that's correct. Okay. Just as an estimate, from 2005 to 2009, is it correct that your agency removed about 8,500 children from their homes? No, that sounds sounds high from 2005 to 2011 that sounds high i can tell you roughly each year we have removed approximately 1100 to maybe 1800 kids and that's year over year and that's year over year and that's and that's a rough estimate sure and how many of those instances again just a rough estimate if you know did your workers obtain warrants prior to removing the child? 
I'm not certain, but it would be probably um, a small percentage of that. Less than 1%? More than that. I'm not certain. I can't even answer that because I have no idea, to be honest with you. Does your agency keep that statistic, how many warrants they've obtained? We try to keep that statistic, but in accordance with the network that we use, Child Welfare Services Case Management System, there's really no place to collect that data. Okay. So how do you try to keep that statistic? We try to keep that statistic manually, which would be difficult to do to collect that data quantitatively in a scientific manner, if you will, a consistent manner. Okay. When did you start attempting to collect that data manually? Probably fairly recent, within maybe the last two years or so, maybe. And again, that's a rough estimate. Who is it that maintains that data? That would depend on where the child was removed, because all removals aren't necessarily first time with the parent. It could be kids that are already placed that's, uh, say, in a group home or something. So it could, depends on the section within that division. Well, actually, children that are already placed in foster care or in a group home, your agency is not required to obtain a warrant to remove that's those true. children. That's true for them. That's correct. Okay. So let's just focus on those circumstances where the agency may be required to get a warrant. And that would be where we're removing a child from its family. And that's, well, I guess that's what I was answering. That's where it gets complicated because we don't, if you will, pull out that data. We don't data mine it that finally because, again, the network that we use doesn't allow us to do that. When we remove a child, it doesn't discern whether or not it comes from a group home, foster home, or the first time that ER worker has made contact with that family. They look at it aggregate because the state keeps that information as a removal. Okay. And isn't it correct, uh, Mr. Riley, that until 2010, in fact, your agency provided no training to its social workers regarding the procedures by which they would obtain a protective custody warrant or removal warrant if, in fact, they wanted to? That's not my understanding. There was training. When? Uh, I don't have the dates. I do know that there's training provided through Public Child Welfare Training Academy, but I don't have the dates as to when. And I do know that um, in one of the categories, it focuses on, um, of course, ethics, law enforcement, and, um, and dealing with the constitutional rights of parents and families. That was the 2012 mandatory civil rights training, correct? They had civil rights training before that. Now, whether or not it was specific to warrants training, I cannot answer that, but they've had ongoing civil rights training before that. Okay. Now, this civil rights training that you're talking about, that's training that your supervisors would have gone to, right? Supervisors go to that, but they also, if you will, provide that information to their individual units. Okay. And in fact, the 2012 January, February mandatory civil rights training, avoiding, what is that called? Avoiding Civil Rights Liability, I think, is what the title of the course was. Mm -hmm. That's something that all of your workers, down to the secretarial level, were required to go to, correct? For the most part, yes. Okay. And that was the first time that you'd had that specific type of training that was offered to all of the children and family services workers, correct? That's correct. Why was that? We started doing that because it became more apparent that we needed to be more, or our staff needed to be more astute and more aware of what's happening as far as litigation is concerned. So am I correct then that you did the training not because you were concerned necessarily about the rights of the people that were impacted by your agency, but instead because of concerns over litigation? we're always concerned about the rights of our families and we feel as though we've always maintained that concern. What we wanted to do was formalize that training to make sure that everyone was told, was given the same consistent message. Okay, and that consistent message was what? It's overbroad. The consistent message for the most part, which has been the message actually long before 2012, is that 
it's a practice that we put in place that I actually put in place in regards to primarily what we want to look at is removal of a child only when it is to be or considered exigent circumstances or the language that my workers and staff use is imminent danger. Okay, what's imminent danger? Imminent danger means that harm can befall the child at any moment, any time, particularly if they're left in that specific environment. Any kind of harm? Any kind of harm. It can be physical harm, it could be severe neglect where the child could harm his or herself. Just so that I make sure I have your understanding of the law clear, you're saying that an exigent circumstance is presented any time that a child could suffer any kind of harm if left in the care of their caregiver? Yes. Okay. When did you acquire that understanding? That has been the understanding for the last several years. Since at least, what, 2005? Probably before 2005. 2002, since, maybe? I would say about 2002. Okay. And that includes emotional harm? That, again, it depends on the circumstances. Okay. Each case is evaluated on its own merit. So it's your testimony here today that a child could, in fact, be removed from the custody of his or her parents without a warrant if they were suffering emotional harm? That misstates his testimony. No, no. Okay, explain, because I misunderstood. <clears throat> I'm talking primarily about physical abuse. Okay. I'm talking primarily about severe neglect where the child is left, where there's a failure, a failure to protect environment and more specifically for children under the age of three. Okay. So, again, just so that I'm clear, it's your understanding that for children under the age of three, if there is a potential they may be physically harmed, mm -hmm. it would be appropriate for your workers to remove the child from the care of the caregiver without a warrant. Yes, and it would be more than a potential, it would be a high probability. Now, does it have to be... Well, let me ask this. At the time of the removal, does there have to be any evidence to suggest that it was the caregiver that harmed the child as opposed to somebody else? At the time when we're doing any kind of assessment, risk assessment, evaluation, investigation with the child that cannot speak, we don't have any idea who the care, who the perpetrator may be. That's what complicates those cases. Well, that doesn't really answer my question though. At the time of the removal, does there have to be any evidence to suggest that it was the caregiver that harmed the child as opposed to somebody else? Oh, I'm sorry. It has to be evidence, yes, that, that it was either the caregiver or the caregiver failed to protect that child from the perpetrator. Okay. And in order for a caregiver to fail to protect, wouldn't there have to be some evidence to suggest that the caretaker knew there was a problem or a potential problem? That would be ideal. Sometimes you would have to assess the environment and assess and give it your best judgment, your best call in real time. Okay. I am correct that in order for a caregiver to fail to protect, there would have to be some evidence to suggest the caretaker knew there was a problem or a potential problem. Yes. Okay. And where there's no evidence that the caretaker knew anything at all about a potential problem, then it wouldn't be appropriate to remove the child from that caretaker, would it? 
Yes, it would. That may even be more concerning if there's evidence of, of uh, physical abuse or injury to the child and the caretaker not even know how it occurred. Okay. So it's Orange County Social Services position that if a caretaker does not know how an injury occurred, it's then up to the caretaker to prove their innocence. And the state's is testimony. It's not a matter of innocence or guilt. Our primary job is to assess what's happening with that child and to protect the child. And it certainly isn't one to impugn the parent until we find out really what happened to the child. So you won't impugn the parent, but you will take the child, even if there's no evidence that the parent injured the child. If the child is injured and we have consulted with medical staff that says that these injuries occurred in a non-accidental way, yes, we will. And just so I'm clear again, you won't impugn the parent but you will take the child even if there is no evidence that the parent injured the child? Yes. Okay. Going back to one of your earlier answers, you had told me that it's been the consistent message, for the most part, long before 2012, strike that. Sean, I think you'd do better without that thing. Yeah, well, I, I got this thing he said that I want to follow up on, and then I got off on a trail somewhere else, so I want to come back to this and get it pinned down, and I have to get it sorted out before I can do that. Okay, this is how we'll do it. We'll just, I'm going to read back the question and the answer just so you have context. Okay. And then I'm going to ask you some questions about sure. your answer. Okay. okay. And my question was, so am I correct then that you did the training not because you were concerned necessarily about the rights of the people that were impacted by your agency, but instead because of concerns over litigation? Answer. We're always concerned about the rights of our families, and we feel as though we've always maintained that concern. What we wanted to do was formalize that training to make sure that everyone was told, was given the same consistent message. Question. Okay, and that consistent message was what? Answer. That consistent message, for the most part, which has been the message long before 2012, is that it is a practice that we put in place, that I actually put in place with regards to primarily what we wanted to look at is removal of the child only when it is to be or considered exigent circumstances or the language that makes my workers and staff use imminent danger. And what I want to ask about is when you said it has long been your agency's consistent message that you wanted, am I understanding correctly that you wanted your social workers to learn, understand, and recognize the constitutional rights that parents and children have to stay together. That's correct. Okay. And you understand that that constitutional right that parents and children have to live and stay together is guaranteed under both the 4th, 14th, yes and First Amendments to the United States Constitution. Yes, I am. Okay. You also understand that in the absence of a true emergency, it's improper to intervene in that family relationship that's preserved by the Constitution. Yes. 
And in fact, there's a well-established body of case law that you are familiar with in your capacity as the director of Orange County Social Services Agency that governs the conduct of your social workers. Yes, I am. Okay. And you're also familiar with the legal proposition that it's improper to remove a child under constitutional theories unless there is reasonable and articulable evidence to support the proposition that the child is in immediate danger of suffering severe bodily injury or death at the hand, hands of the parents, correct? That, Repeat that, that, please. Let me make sure I understand what your question is. Sure. Council, I'm not sure I heard you make a comment. I, I, I'll let him read the question, then I'll let her pose my objection. You are familiar with the legal proposition that it is improper to remove a child under constitutional theories unless there is a reasonable and articulable evidence. Actually, let me reread that whole thing. I'm messing it up. You are aware that it is constitutionally improper to remove a child from the custody of its parents unless there is reasonable and articulable evidence to support the conclusion that the child is in immediate danger of suffering severe bodily injury or death in the time it would get, take to get a warrant if the child's left with the parents. That's correct. Okay. If I may. Well, is, hold on. Hold on if you want to no. make your answer complete. If he the wants answer to was correct, and I have follow-up, and if he wants to explain himself in the follow-up, we'll deal with that. Please continue. No, absolutely okay. not. Okay, then you're not getting his complete answer. That's fine. And we'll, you, you, can, can't cut, you can't cut a witness off. You can't do it at trial, and you can't do you it can, at You can move to do whatever it is you want to do. I'll move to strike the question and the answer, because you've that's, not allowed him to answer it. That's fine. He's answered it. And I move to strike it. You haven't, he, he hasn't Motion's your, denied. You haven't per, allowed him to provide his answer, so Motion's denied. the answer's worthless. Motion's denied. I'm sure Judge Stock will appreciate your humor. You're also aware, aren't you, that where there is no evidence to support the proposition that one of the parents harmed the child, it's improper to remove the child from that person's care. That's true. Okay. So if you have one parent where there is a reasonable suspicion that parent harmed the child, but you have another parent where you have no evidence at all to suggest that parent harmed the child, in order to remove the child from the non-offending parent's custody, you need to go get a warrant, correct? Unless we feel as though the non-offending parent failed to protect that child knowing who the perpetrator is. Okay, so you have to have some evidence to suggest that the non-offending parent knew who the perpetrator was yet failed to protect the child. Yes. Okay. And when there is no such evidence, it would be improper to remove the child without first obtaining a warrant or court order. Not necessarily. Okay, give me all the circumstances where not necessarily applies. It, it, it's overbroad. I can give you one example. Sure. Uh, a married couple. It mm -hmm. is safe to assume that since they are a married couple living together, it would be a safe guess to say that the non-offending parent would know who the perpetrator is. When we're making the decision to remove a child, let's use your example from a married couple, doesn't the conduct of the agency to protect the child have to be narrowly tailored to avoid impinging too far on the parent-child relationship with the non-offending parent? Yes. And by narrowly tailored, doesn't that mean that we have to look for less intrusive alternative means than full-out removal from both parents. That's true, and oftentimes we do. 
But not always. Not always. Okay. Depends on the circumstances. Okay. And when you don't have any evidence to support a conclusion that either parent injured the child themselves or even knew about somebody injuring the child, what would the less intrusive alternative means be there? It's compound and it's vague and ambiguous and overbroad. As far as I'm concerned, if there is a child that cannot speak for his or herself and there are significant injuries and the physician tells us so, we will detain that child what? until we find otherwise. What happens when there's conflicting physician reports? What we know we have is we have a child with injuries. Mm -hmm. Until there is further discussion or consultation with medical staff, we will err on the side of safety for that child. And by error on the side of safety for the child, you mean you will remove that child from the care of its parents without a warrant or court order, even when there is no evidence to suggest those parents either harm the child themselves or knew the child was harmed? If it is exigent, exigent circumstances, yes. What do you mean by that? Again, as I had stated earlier, when there is immediate harm to that child, that if that child is left in that environment or in a situation where it could be brought back to that environment, we will detain that child. Okay. How long did you spend preparing for your deposition? Um, a few days. All day? No. Well. No, no, you give me an day. hour estimate. How many hours? <laughs> uh, maybe, maybe five or six hours, something like that, throughout the several days, past several days. Have you been deposed in one of these civil rights cases before? Many years ago, yes, I have. What case was that? That was a case, actually, it was an internal, it was a personnel issue. You know, I was deposed on the grounds that uh, employee was released based on race. How many years ago was that? It would have to have been probably about maybe 13 years ago, maybe something okay. like that. Hey, Sean, it looks like you might be shifting gears. Do you mind if we take a bathroom break? Uh, just one more question. I'm not quite there yet, okay. but I'm close. Well, you know what? You want to take a bathroom break? I'm I don't really need right one, now. but if I'm you good need for it. right now, but well, then keep going. I can I can wait till you get to a logical breaking point. Though. I don't want to torture you. If you're I'm okay. I know you do. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't. How about the reporter breaks the time? Do you need a break? Sure. All right, let's do it. Yeah, it works for me. We're going off the record. The time is 11:07 a.m. Okay. So we're back on the record. The time is 11.25 a.m. Okay. Mr. Riley, earlier in your testimony, you said it's long been your agency's consistent message that you want your social workers to learn, understand, and recognize the constitutional rights that parents and children have to stay together. Yes. What have you, acting as the head of the agency, done to ensure that your policies are followed? It's a objection, it's overbroad. You can answer the question though, if you understand. Okay. There's two ways. One, training. And since 1996, the um, California Social Work 
Educational Center, which is otherwise known as Cal SWIC, uh -huh. provides standardized training for all. I'm sorry, was that Cal SWIC? Cal SWIC. Cal, C A L S W E C. California Social Worker Educational Center. Got it. Thank you. That's a collaboration of many of the UC and Cal State universities, depending on the region, that provide standardized training for all first year frontline social workers. And laws, civil rights, and ethics is trained and has been trained since that time. Since 1996? Since 1996. You said there were two things. One was training. The other part, of course, enforcement of that training. And let, just share with us what you mean by enforcement. It is incumbent upon our, social, our supervisors and our program managers to make sure that the social workers are discharging their duties as they are trained and as we expect them to. And what does your agency do to make sure that actually happens? In unit meetings, when they meet with them on a regular basis to make sure that they are, again, following policies and procedures and that they are doing what they need to do to keep families together or to keep children safe. That also includes from our quality assurance unit to randomly pull cases from time to time that has nothing to do with any particular issue but just review cases to make sure it's going well and also for the supervisor to call the families at least one social worker every six months to call and see how the social worker is treating them and how they uh, they feel supported by the social worker do you ever hear complaints let me put it this way since say january 2008 have you ever heard complaints from parents that uh, social workers were being less than honest in their court reporting? Yes, we've had those complaints. Have them frequently? It's big. We don't have them frequently, but we do have them every now and then, and we take them very seriously when we get them. Are you aware of whether or not any social worker for your agency has testified in their deposition that in up to 50% of the cases, parents complain of social worker dishonesty in their reporting? I wasn't aware of that, but I'm aware that we get several complaints that they're not happy with their social worker. Okay. You attended, didn't you, the oral argument on the Fogarty matter? No, I was not there. You weren't there? I did not even know that case was going on until after it was over. Okay, and did you yourself undertake any investigation of that case after it was over? We looked at that case. My understanding was the um, we looked at that case as we do all cases brought before us with potential litigation to discern whether or not there's been any proprieties or any illegalities or anything that was done improperly. Um, afterwards, we also reviewed it just to make sure. And it was your position after a jury entered its verdict against the social workers and Orange County that the social workers did nothing wrong? That's correct. Okay. I'm going to mark as Exhibit 134 to your deposition. A memo. I'm going to ask you if you would identify that memo for me. What is that? Can you have an opportunity to read it? Sure.
Okay. What is that document that's been marked as Exhibit 134? This is a document sent out by Ingrid Herita, then the Director of Social Services Agency, in regards to the recent court actions taken in regards to the Fogarty Hardwood case. Does your name also appear on the document right uh, underneath Ingrid Herita's? Yes, as Chief Deputy Director. Okay. Did you partake in any drafting or reviewing of this document before it went out? Reviewing, but not drafting. Okay. Do you know who did draft it? Ingrid Herita. Okay. And you reviewed it before she sent it out to your yes. social workers? Yes, I did. Okay. And you agreed with everything in it? Yes. Okay. Did you yourself undertake any investigation of the Fogarty Hardwick allegations after the jury rendered its positive verdict? By me and myself, mean I personally did the interv uh, investigation or I had staff do the follow-up investigation? Well, did you personally yourself do any investigation? Did you review any documents, talk to any social workers, anything? Yes, I reviewed documents and talked to social workers. Who did you talk to? I talked to the two social workers, the one social worker and the supervisor that were directly involved and talked to the uh, quality assurance staff as well as program managers. That would have been the social workers were Helen Dwojak, the supervisor, and Marsha Marcy. Vreken. Right. Correct? Mm -hmm. Talked and, with both of them. And what did they tell you? They, for the most part, told me that they discharged their duties uh, within regulation and appropriately. And that they followed all the county's policies, practices, and procedures that were in force and effect at the time. That's correct. Okay. Were any policy changes made as a result of that verdict? Not as a result of that but we already had policy changes in the works as far as practice changes. That's when we went into our family-to-family -family model. That's when TDMs came into play. And just so that I'm clear here, was it your position after speaking with Ms. Dwojak and Mrs. Vreken that they did not lie and suppress exculpatory evidence? Was that your that, that position? Was my, that was my understanding, yes. Okay, so even though the jury disagreed with you, that's still the position you took? Sorry, yes. Sorry. Okay. What was the purpose of this letter that you sent out to your social workers? As I stated earlier, we did not even know this particular trial was ongoing and we didn't find out till after the fact so the purpose of this was to if you will kind of serve as a heads up that um, these kinds of things can happen in the future that before these kind of things occur again they should consult with their managers deputies and go up the chain to make sure that they get adequate support okay we also told your staff here that um the defendants were indemnified by the county. Yes. And by indemnified, that means that the county paid the judgment for them. That's correct. And you also told the staff that you sent this memo out to that the county also paid the punitive damages award against Ms. Bojack and Mrs. Vreekin, correct? That's correct. And did the county actually do that, pay the punitive damages award? Yes, they did. Okay. And you understand, don't you, Mr. Riley, that Punitive damages are a punishment that the jury assesses when they make a finding by clear and convincing evidence that the conduct of the defendant's social workers was engaged in with malice, oppression, or fraud. It, call, it calls for speculation and it calls for a legal conclusion. I understand the question. You understand that that is correct. I understand what punitive damages are. Okay, and you understand that in the Fogarty case, the jury actually returned a verdict saying that Ms. Dwojak and Ms. Vreekin violated Ms. Fogarty Hardwick's constitutional rights maliciously, oppressively, and fraudulently, correct? That's what they said. Okay, and you disagreed with that? Absolutely. Okay, and that's why you indemnified the social worker defendants. Yes. Well, it lacks foundation that this witness indemnified these 
Who made the workers. decision to indemnify these social workers? The Board of Supervisors. Okay. And that was in consultation with you. You actually presented in a closed session before the Board of Supervisors, well, correct? Well, hold on a second. No, no, no. That would invade attorney-client privilege information. If it was presented in a closed session meeting, you don't get to ask them questions about it. Well. Don't answer the question. Was it in a closed meeting or open meeting that you suggested that the board indemnify these social workers for punitive damages? It lacks foundation. I did neither. It was a recommendation that comes from risk management, not me. Who at risk management made that decision? Calls for speculation. If you know. Let me see. I was trying to think of who the director was at that time. The current director is Tom Phillips. But I don't think he was there then, but I'm not certain. Okay. Did the risk manager director make that decision in consultation with you? Yes. And you agreed and with Ingrid him? and Ms. Harita. Okay. Mm -hmm. And you agreed that they should be indemnified, the yes. defendant social workers? Yes. I'm sorry, you agreed that the defendant social workers should be indemnified for the punitive damages assessed against them? Yes. Okay. And then in May of 2007, you reviewed and approved of this memorandum that was then sent out to staff, letting them know that you supported them and that you stood behind them, correct? As long as they work within the scope of their responsibilities and duties, yes. Okay. And in fact, you said this. It's the long-standing policy of the Social Services Agency, CEO Risk Management, the County Council's Office, and the Board of Supervisors to stand behind county employees who undertake their job performance in good faith on behalf of the county and the people we serve. Yes. So it was your position and you were communicating this to your staff that the conduct that Ms. Vreken and Dwojak had been found liable for by a jury of Orange County citizens was in fact in good faith and in the performance of their job duties as county employees. Yes. Did you review the verdict before you made this decision? Yes, I did. Did you review the transcripts of the trial before you made this decision? Not the transcripts, no, I did not. Okay, all you did was talk to the defendants, Ms. Wojak and Mrs. Reekin? And counsel. Well, I'm not allowed to ask you about that. I'd love to. <laughs> now, one of the things that you do, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm assuming you do this, is when the appellate courts come out with important decisions, whether they're published or unpublished, that affect the work that your agency mm -hmm. does, you review those decisions. Yes, I do. And to the extent that some sort of remedial policy decisions need to be made, you're the one that would make those decisions? Yes. And then you would either yourself promulgate a policy or direct one of your subordinate staff members to promulgate a policy for your approval that would then address the appellate issues. Yes. Okay. And when an appellate court specifically calls out your agency and says, in essence, to you, what you're doing needs to stop, do you take that seriously? I take that very seriously. Are you familiar with a case called Jonathan M? No, I'm not. Okay. We're going to take about a 10 minute break and I'll see if I can give you a copy. Okay. Why don't we do this? We could probably beat the lunch crowd if we went and did our lunch now. You can get your case. Yeah. You want to do that? that? Come back or at 1210? We'll get back as quick as we can. I don't want you to be here to start the deposition without him if we're not here by oh, I'll, I'll fill in for him. I mean, I know what he's going to say. <laughs> now we're off the record. This is the end of this one. We're off the record at 1142 a.m. All right, we'll get back to
We're back on the record. This is the beginning of disc two, and the time is 12.34 p.m. Okay. Uh, Mr. Riley, have you had a chance? Uh, we took a lunch break, about 45 minutes or so. Did you have a chance to uh, take a look at the case Jonathan M. while you were at lunch? No, I did not. Okay. I'm going to show you what we will mark as exhibit number 135 to your deposition. I'm going to ask you if you would to take a look at that. And specifically, I'm going to be asking you some questions about the bracketed portion on page 7 and 8 of that decision. Okay. I'll hold copy for me. Yeah. <coughs> For the record, this is the unpublished case of Jonathan M. v. Superior Court? Correct. Now, just for a moment, going back to the Fogarty-Hardwick case, when you were investigating the outcome of that case, did you have a chance to read the appellate decision in that case? No, I did not read it. Have you ever read it? No, I have not. Okay. Is there a reason you didn't read it? At that time, I didn't read it. Um, because I was directly involved and I had discussed it with our attorney, but I did not read the pellet. I did not read it, no. Okay. Were you aware, other than discussions with your attorney, that the appellate court in the Fogarty Hardwick case specifically said that the conduct she complained of and proved to the jury? was not an isolated incident. Yes, I was aware of that. Okay. You just disagreed with it? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. <clears throat> you were aware that Ms. Fogarty had complained and proven to a jury that the supervisor, Helen Dwojak, and her subordinate social worker, Marcy Vreken, had suppressed material exculpatory evidence, correct? Yes, I'm aware of that. Okay, and you're also aware that Ms. Fogarty <clears throat> in her case, Fogarty Hardwick v. County of Orange et al., proved to the satisfaction of the jury that Ms. Dwojak and Ms. Vreken also lied to the juvenile court, correct? Yes. Okay. You just disagreed with the jury? Exactly. Okay. Now, Ms. Freakin, she was promoted, promoted to supervisor, correct? Yes. 
At the time of the conduct complained of in the Fogarty Hardwick matter, she was simply a case carrying social worker. Yes. And Miss Dwojak at that time was a supervisor, correct? Correct. And she retired with full pay and benefits, correct? Correct. Neither of them were disciplined for their conduct in relation to the Fogarty Hardwick matter. Correct. Okay. In fact, there was never a thought that they would be disciplined, was there? That's correct. Okay. Moving forward to <coughs> August of 2010, is it your understanding that that's when the same appellate court, the 4th Appellate District Division 3, issued the decision in Jonathan M? Calls for speculation. Oh was not aware of this case. Okay. Earlier when you told me that, let me make sure I get your words right. You told me that when appellate courts come out with important decisions, whether they're published or unpublished, that affect the work your agency does, you review those decisions. So I review them with staff, yes. That okay. means I may not review every word of it, but I do discuss them. Okay. But you didn't review with staff the Fogarty Hardwick decision? I reviewed with our counsel. Okay. But you didn't read the case yourself? I did not read the case, no. And Jonathan M. filed August 27, 2010. Did you review that with staff? I did not review that one. I was unaware of this case. Okay. In this case, if you turn to page 7, Justices <coughs> Bedsworth, Rylersdam, and Moore wrote a message to the county, didn't they? Yes, they did. And in that message, they're telling the county, this kind of pleading undermines confidence in the system. It damages the reputation of the social services agency and causes parents to suspect the system is prejudiced against them. And social workers will use any excuse they can think of, whether credible or not, to deprive them of the custody of their children. Did I read that correctly? Yes, you did. Do you think that's an important message that the appellate court was sending your agency in August of 2010? That's a very important message. But you never read it. I never read it, but and even nobody ever. Go ahead. Ahead. Let him finish his answer. Go ahead. But even without reading it, I believe that, even without them telling me that. Okay. Their next statement, and it's italicized, presumably for emphasis, says, it has to stop. Do you understand the appellate court there is sending your agency a pretty strong message? Yes, I do. And yet you never read this decision? No, I did not. And we're completely and totally unaware of it until I showed it to you here today. That's correct. Okay. It goes on to say, to explain why the behavior has to stop. No one in government has a more important job than the employees of the social services agency. No one has a more critical task than the protection of our children. Would you agree with that statement? Yes, I do. It's essential to our society that this charge be carried out with compassion and fairness. You agree with that statement? Yes, I do. Okay. Alleging that a father is a danger to his preschool children because he had sex with their mother when they were teenagers is not calculated to improve the credibility of the people who daily shoulder this burden. You agree with that, don't you? Yes, I do. What policies were in place? in 2010 to make sure that your subordinates did not make overzealous and false claims in juvenile dependency petitions? It's overbroad. The same policies we've had in place for several years and uh, in regards to ethics and when in the course of an investigation that they do not falsify, exaggerate, omit, purposely omit any information. Even exculpatory information? Yes. So how did that happen in this case, Jonathan M? Cause for speculation. I, I don't know since I'm not familiar with this case. Okay. And it shouldn't happen. Okay. 
but you admit that it does. It calls for speculation. I don't. I, I would say that if it does occur, that it's very rare. It's very rare. If it does occur. If it occurs at all, it's very rare. Yes. So you doubt what the appellate court here is saying is that it did occur. You disagree with them? No, I can't. I have no opinion. I'm not familiar with the okay. case at all. I have to go back and review it. Okay, but you are saying that if it does occur, it's very rare. That's your testimony here today? Yeah, that certainly. That I'm not saying that we're perfect. Okay. The court goes on to say in its message to your agency, as reflected in the facts underlying the other counts alleged against the parents in this case, SSA, that's Social Services Agency, right? Yes. Had perfectly legitimate reasons for requesting that the court take jurisdiction over these children. If SSA was concerned that those legitimate reasons might not be deemed persuasive enough by the court, its re response should have been <coughs> to throw in an additional, I'm sorry, I misspoke. Its response should not have been to throw in an additional sexual abuse count. Did I read that right? Yes. Why is it, why is it that social services should not throw in additional greater counts than it has evidence to support? Because they don't have evidence to support it. That's why they shouldn't throw it in. Okay. And in the petition, those are actually attested to under penalty of perjury, right? Yes. And if we put in additional accounts that sound more serious when we have no evidence to support them, mm -hmm. that would make them untrue, correct? Yes, unless they had more reasons or circumstances that I see here, yes. Okay. And then the appellate court goes on to explain why it's important that, you know, we as social workers don't exaggerate the circumstances. It's because it might be interpreted as an attempt to frighten the parents into submitting to jurisdiction on the other counts, right? I agree wholeheartedly with that. And that would be improper. Yes, it would. Okay. And you would also agree, agree that instead of exaggerating claims in the sworn petition, the agents working on the claim should invest more time in investigating the allegations that are really there. Absolutely. Before they sign it under penalty of perjury. Yes. Okay. So what did the agency do prior to August 27, 2010 to make sure that this type of thing doesn't happen. Excuse me. <coughs> Excuse me. Again, as I stated earlier, we train to ethics. That's one of the one of the main things we train to is ethics. We train to a disciplined approach to finding evidence. And uh, I will just state that here that I have told our staff on several occasions it's not our job to, quote, find someone guilty. It is only our job to find evidence that will either support or reject findings. When did you start telling your staff that? It's always been the way. Um, I can't say that I know the exact date or when that became formal, but I, uh, it's always been my principles and expectations. Well expectations how does a line worker know what your expectations are unless it's formalized somewhere it's formalized in training okay that would be like the january february 2012 mandatory civil rights training for example it would be before that it would be just ongoing training of what a line worker gets within their first 12 months in regards to how to go about doing an investigation how to write a court report how to make sure they do not violate family civil rights. And yet, we know 
that it still happens. And when it does happen, when I have facts, then I will, we move to discipline those workers. Were any of the workers in Jonathan M. disciplined? Again, I, I have to go back and find out. Okay. Well, you don't even know about the case. I don't so. know about the case. Right. And, but you do know that none of the workers in the Fogarty Hardwick case were disciplined. Yes, because I knew about that one after the fact. Okay. And, of course, you believed and supported your workers. With the Fogarty Hardwood case, that's correct. Okay. With great power comes great responsibility. You agree with that? Absolutely. And the Social Services Agency has great power. You agree with that? Yes, we do. In fact, your agency has the power to protect or destroy families. That's protect. We have we are charged with protecting children and keeping families together, not destroying. But you would agree with me, wouldn't you, sir, that when that type of power is misused, the effect can be to destroy families? When it's misused, it absolutely can harm a family. Okay. Now, if we go on, on page 8 of the Jonathan M. decision, before we do that, I want to make sure I got something you said. Correct. Okay. When well, we're talking about the facts and circumstances of the Jonathan M. case, where they exaggerated some of the claims, and that that type of exaggeration might be interpreted as an attempt to frighten parents into submitting to jurisdiction. Right? You remember that mm -hmm. discussion? Yes? Yes. Okay. And you had told me that you would say if that does occur, it's very rare. You recall that? Yes, I do recall okay. saying that. In looking at the remainder of the appellate court's admonishment to your agency, it says, the facts of this case and others brought to us in recent months suggest the agency has somehow temporarily detoured from its long tradition of exercising that power wisely and responsibly. Did I read that right? Where are you again? Page oh, I see. Eight. I see it. I see it. Yes, you did. Are you familiar at all with the case N. Ray Tyler H. that was cited by the 4th District Court of Appeal? No, I'm not. Okay, so that's another case that was important to them that you didn't read. No. No, you didn't read it? No, I did not read it. Okay, and you're completely unfamiliar with it? Yes, I am. Okay. So what has your agency done since 2010 to try to return to that tradition of exercising its power wisely and responsibly? First, I understand, based upon what I see here, why the appellate court said what they said. My feeling is, and with my responsibility as the director of social services agency, I believe we already are doing that. That doesn't mean that there are not mistakes made. And when I find out those kinds of, quote, detours occur, I move to reconcile that immediately. And how is it that you normally find out that these quote-unquote detours occur? Internal investigations. What triggers those internal investigations? Usually parental complaints. Is an internal investigation of the type you're talking about here ever triggered by a lawsuit? Yes, they are. Okay. Do you remember the lawsuit Balsitis v. County of Orange. Yes, I do. Do you remember what the allegations of that complaint were? I remember the case. Um, I also vaguely remember um, some of the issues, but I can't remember the details to the level you're asking. Okay. That was a warrantless removal case, right? Yes, it was. Yeah, I'm going to object. I, I believe that was the case that was settled, wasn't it? Sure was. 
Okay. Well, I don't know what bearing, if any, that would have. Pattern practice, we absolutely have to show that this is a recurring okay. event. If you want to, if you want to instruct him I'll not instruct to answer, him. we will definitely take this in front of the judge. Okay. I'm going to instruct him not to answer any cases, any questions about a case that was settled. Okay. Okay. With regard to Balsitis v. County of Orange, that was 2009 case, correct? Instruct him not to answer. Well, you know, you can answer that. That's a foundational question. I don't remember the year, but could, that's probably sounds about right. The allegations in that case were that the child was seized when there was no exigent circumstance and no warrant was obtained, correct? Instruct him not to answer. As part of the resolution in that case, your agency agreed to conduct a policy review, correct? Instruct him not to answer. And just so that we know this, you're going to follow your attorney's instruction? Yes. Okay. Did Orange County actually conduct a policy review of its warrant policies in 2009 as what was required under the terms of that settlement? <clears throat> yes, we did. Okay. And did you change policies at that time? We did not change policies, but we certainly, if you will, refined them and uh, modified them. Did you provide any training as a result of those 2009 refinements and modifications? Yes. When was that training provided? I don't have any dates or times of the training, um, but it was reported, or it was, if you will, uh, directed that each program manager Deputy Director, go back and retrain, feel re-educate their staff mm -hmm. on the handling of, of warrants and exigent circumstances. Okay. Now, in the Balsitis case, it was a similar circumstance as Jonathan M., wasn't it? Didn't the parents plead then to a lesser charge in order to get their child back? I'm going to instruct the witness not to answer. Are you going to follow your attorney's instruction? Yes, I am. Okay. The case has nothing to do with this case. Well, you can say that. You'll argue it to the judge. Okay. Now, there's a more recent case that was a warrantless removal case. That was the Milligan Cole case, correct? I struck, instruct him not to answer. You're aware that in that case, there were also allegations that the social workers removed the children with a lack of exigent circumstances and failed to obtain a warrant. Correct? Instruct him not to answer. And you settled that case as well? Instruct him not to answer. Okay. And of course, you're going to follow your attorney's instructions yes. on every one of these. And again, the basis for the instruction was? Those cases have nothing to do with the present case. I understand your position is that you have a Monell claim in this. I allowed you to answer uh, him to answer questions about Fogarty Hardwick. You're asking him about cases that were settled. So there's been nothing proven in either one of those cases that would help you on your Monell claim, and there's nothing, nothing in these questions is calculated to lead to the admissibility, or to the discovery of admissible evidence. Okay, any other bases, or is that it? I think probably privacy issues with regard to the kids that were involved in those cases, too. Well, we haven't gotten into the details of those, well, that but if you want any 27 petitions, we'll go ahead and file them. That's <clears> part <throat> of my objection as well. Are you aware of the uh, Randall v. County of Orange case? Yes. Okay. And you're aware that in that case, um, there was also a removal, correct? Hold on a second. I have an 827 petition in that case. You, you very way. Is this pending litigation? Sure. Okay, then I'm instructing him not to answer. Are you going to follow the instruction? Yes. And you're aware that in that case, the child again was ultimately given back to the mother. Instruct him not to answer. Have you undertaken any investigation into the underlying circumstances of the Balsitis case? What we've done is anytime when we meet with risk management and discuss these cases, we always look to see if there are things we can do to enhance our practice and tweak and modify our policies. Okay. So your investigation is only in relation to reducing your risk exposure? No. It also includes looking at what the social worker did to make sure that he or she did not do anything that violated the rights or the regulations, WIC code regulations. With what? WIC code regulations, violated any of the WIC code regulations. That's the Welfare and Institutions well, Code? Yes. Mm -hmm.
And when you find that something did go wrong in relation to the violation of parents' rights, you go ahead, go ahead and refine or modify your policies and then provide additional training. And or discipline the worker or staff involved. Okay. Were any of the worker or staff involved in the Balsidas case disciplined? I don't remember. To be I don't remember. Okay. Were any of the worker or staff involved in the Milligan Cole case disciplined? No. Okay. Were any of the staff involved, oh, we already know that, in the Fogarty Hardwick case, they weren't disciplined? No. In fact, they were promoted, one of them. Yes. She now trains other social workers, right? No, not now. Can't remember where she is now, but that was a short period of time. Okay. And she moved to another program, to be honest with that. I don't remember which one, okay. but she's no longer training. Okay, but for a period of time, she... For a period of time, yes. ...was training other social workers. Yes. Now you have been the director of the social services agency since the morning of July 20th. 29th. I'm sorry? 29th, actually. Yeah, I'm going to show you what will mark as Exhibit 136 to your deposition ask you if you could take a look at that for me. Who is uh, Jill Burrell? My secretary. Okay. And uh, you see the <coughs> date when this was sent was Tuesday, July 20th, 2010 at 12.45 p.m.? Yes. And it went to all SSA staff? Mm -hmm. That's yes? Yes. It would have been SSA, again, that's Social Services Agency staff? Yes. So that would have been everybody, secretaries, social workers? Everyone in Social Services Agency. The janitor, everybody. Everyone. Okay. And it says, I'm very pleased to announce that this morning the Board of Supervisors officially appointed Dr. Michael Riley as the Director of the Social Services Agency, effective <coughs> July 30th, 2010. Right. Okay. So does that refresh your recollection that as of the morning of July 20th, 2010, you had already been appointed to the position as director, but it just didn't become effective till July 30th, 2010? That's correct, because Ingrid Harita did not officially leave her post until July 29th. Okay. And just so that I'm clear, as the director of the entire agency with regard to policies, practices, customs, training, the buck essentially stops with you. Absolutely. Okay. And when you are in charge of the children and family services, isn't it also true that under Larry Lehman and Ingrid Harita, they both deferred to your judgment in policy matters. Yes, they did. So even there, the buck essentially stopped with you in relation to policies, practices, customs, and training within the Children and Family Services Unit. Mm -hmm. Yes.
Have you had an opportunity to speak with any of the staff that were involved in the Stokes matter? No, I have not. Have you yourself done any investigation into the underlying facts and circumstances in this case? I reviewed the, re I reviewed the QA review of the case. QA review? What's the quality that? assurance review of the case. Who conducted that? A quality assurance unit. Do they generate a written report? Yes, they do. Who signed that report? The program manager of the quality assurance unit. Do you have a name? Tricia Schwinn. S C H W E E N, I believe. Could be off a letter or two. Sure. Was that a long report? Not very, about four or five pages, maybe. What'd you say in that report? Well, hold on a second. I just want to make sure that we're not giving up something that might be protected by some privilege. Can I speak with him briefly? Sure. Going on with the record, the time is 1.05 p.m. Back on the record, the time is 1.09 p.m. Okay. Uh, let me get... Okay, going back to the quality assurance report that Tricia Schwinn provided for you. Is Tricia Schwinn an attorney? No, she isn't. These quality assurance reports, what's the purpose of those reports? The, it's, it's, it's over broader. Are you asking about the specific one or just every one of them? Just generally, what's the purpose of a quality assurance report? It's over broad. What we use our QA unit for is to review cases, first of all, randomly, just as ongoing quality assurance. Also, when a case becomes known to us when a claim has been filed to review to see if there are any improprieties or any concerns. Okay. So, just so that I'm clear, if you get, for example, a government tort claim served on your agency, then an inquiry would go out to Quality Assurance to do a review of the case related to that government tort claim? Yes. Okay. Is Tricia Schwinn an attorney? No, she is not. Do you, does social services, your agency, have any internal attorneys? Yes, we do. Okay. Other than county council? Just county council. Okay, just county council. Does county council, if you know, uh, participate in the quality assurance investigation? They're done for county council and, and um, also recipient of it as well. I'm sorry, say again? the recipient of the report as well, but they're done under the auspices, if you will, of county council. Okay. And you're pretty sure that in this case, the Taylor Stokes matter, a quality assurance um, review and report was conducted? Yes, it was. Okay. Do you know whether it's just a matter of policy, it's something that's done automatically, where a claim will come in, a quality assurance review will be done, a report will re be written up, and then it will automatically be sent to county council? Or is that something that county council specifically requests? It's a standard, if you will, standard practice. Okay, so it's, a stand it's something that just automatically happens. Right. And then what else, what happens with that report, if you know? Does it go to anybody else? No. Does it go to the risk managers? No. So it just goes to you and to county council? Yes. What's the reason that it goes to you? Uh, so that we can discuss 
the findings and make a determination again if any if there needs to be any discipline or anything else we need to, to change modify or or anything along those lines okay so you'll look at the quality assurance report and make a decision whether for example we need to tweak or modify or revise any policies governing or, the social workers conduct yes or you might uh, make a decision whether or not we need to provide any further training regarding the social workers conduct yes based on what's contained in those reports correct and then also you might determine whether or not any discipline needs to be meted out correct okay. and that's all something that you decide on your end correct? yes that's correct and that's before any conference with council yes well, well, I don't know. Broad. Okay. Then at some point, in some circumstances, but not all, you might go a step further and confer with county council about the substance of the report. Oh, yes. Okay. But county council doesn't have anything to do with your decision to either discipline the um, errant employees or promulgate further training or tweak or modify policies, do they? That's your decision. It's it overbroad. It depends on the level of discipline. For example, if I move to terminate that particular employee, then it goes to not only county council, but it also goes to the director, the corporate director mm -hmm. over HR services. Okay. And that is in consult with corporate county council. Okay. Have you ever, since 1997, suggested that a social services employee be disciplined in any way for making inaccurate or untrue statements in a court report? Yes. When? I don't know the exact dates, but I do know that we have terminated social workers who have falsified court reports. Three come to mind. When? Generally? Uh, it, sometime I would say probably within the last three or four years. And there's been other discipline meted out even before that just did not rise to the level of termination. But again, I don't have the exact number. Okay. How about, uh, how did it come to your attention in those cases that the social workers had been dishonest in their reporting to the court? Through the QA process? Or if uh, sometimes I am not even aware of an action until it comes to me and I review it. In other words, I don't know what happened before that, mm -hmm. but when it comes to me, then I review the case. And in some cases, I do know what happens and I recommend termination. Other times, termination can be recommended by one of my deputy directors, but I have to approve it. Well, you're saying times, many times, other times, sometimes. You've only identified identified for me three that were terminated okay how many social workers were disciplined in the last three years for making untrue or false or misleading statements in court reports that's what those three were terminated for in regards to just disciplined, disciplined. in any way at all I don't always know about that when it's a suspension and or termination it rises to my level for approval if it's a written reprimand it doesn't come to me it comes to either it just comes to the division director so there are probably some out there that I'm not even aware of and some of them have nothing to do with any lawsuits it's just cases we discover and we discover that the social worker acted improperly so it's not certainly not tied to litigation, it's tied to performance. Okay. Do you know Patricia Dumas? Uh, I remember she was involved with Fogarty Hartwick, but outside of that I don't know her beyond that. Okay. Do you know whether or not she was terminated from the agency? She was terminated. It had nothing to do with Fogarty Hartwick. She wasn't terminated for... Have you ever heard the phrase, not a team player? Oh, certainly I've heard that phrase. What does that mean in the context of the work that you do there at the agency? Well, in the context that they used it, obviously they're saying that she didn't 
go along with him. That's not my definition of team player. Okay. Is it your understanding that in part Patricia Dumas was terminated for not being a team player? Absolutely not. It had nothing to do with it? No. She wasn't even in Children and Family Services. She had been outside of Children and Family Services for several years before she was terminated. She was terminated shortly after the verdict in the Fogarty Hardwick case though, right? Not that I'm aware of. I thought that happened several, at least several months beyond that. And she wasn't in CFS at the time. She was terminated. Okay. In fact, uh, after her testimony in the Fogarty Hardwick case, she was transferred out of her unit into a different unit, correct? I don't know, probably. I can't okay. answer that for sure. And she was excluded from uh, staff meetings? No, that I don't know, and I would find that highly irregular and unusual, if that is in mm -hmm. fact true. And when she inquired into why that was happening, she was told she was not a team player. That doesn't ring a bell? No. This is the first time I, outside mm -hmm. of reading the report where I'd know she was termed not a team player, but not in the context that she was not allowed to participate in any of the staff meetings. Okay, so first you actually... I've heard of this. All right. So, well, other than outside the context of the report. Right. Okay, so you actually read the report mm -hmm. where they said she was not a team player. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. And you never did any independent investigation or research to determine what they meant by that? Oh, absolutely. That was part of the review of the case. And that, that certainly leads directly to, again, trying to force her into making false statements. And we found that not to be true. I'm sorry. Say that again. My understanding, the way you worded the question, is that you ask if we actually reviewed and if we did anything about following up on that statement, team player. And my response to that is that we certainly did look at that and we did not find evidence of, quote, team player because she did not go along with them. Okay. But you do know that, and when you say did not go along with them, you're referring to Ms. Dwo Dwojak and Ms. Vreekin? Yes. At the Fogarty Hardwick trial? Yes. And when you say she did not go along with them, she actually gave testimony that was supportive of plaintiff, correct? That was my understanding, yes. And that Ms. Vreekin and Ms. Dwojak then were saying she was not a team player. That's, I, assume, I assume that's where that came from, yes. Okay. Well, I mean, you, you saw that in the context mm -hmm. of yes. the report that you read. That's correct. And that was the report that you re read in um, reviewing whether or not to terminate this woman. Right. Okay. We didn't terminate. What happened with Ms. Dumas had nothing to do with Fogarty Hardwick. So why was the not a team player comment even in the report? Calls for speculation. I had no idea. <clears throat> Who wrote that report? Uh, uh, for clarification, what, which report are you talking about? The one you're talking about. Oh, the QA report? Yeah. Okay, then we're not going to talk about yeah. the contents of that report. It's right. the same objection as the... Well, we've already the covered the contents. I'm wondering about who wrote it. Was that also Patricia? Was it Trish or Patricia? It's Trisha. Was that also Trisha yes. Schwinn? Yes. Let me see. That would have been... I believe it would have been Trisha. There were a lot of other issues that I cannot disclose sure. because personnel issues obviously are protected. Sure, I understand. When you do one of these investigations on an emergency response referral, mm -hmm. 
according to your policies, training, practices, and customs. And by your, I'm using that loosely to mean the agency that you are in charge of. Sure. Okay. It's important that that be an active investigation, right? Yes. And in fact, under Welfare and Institutions Code Section 309, you are required to do an independent investigation. Yes. You can't just rely on police reports or work investigatory work that police have done on their own. That's right. Okay. And as part of that investigation, your workers are required to talk to the collateral contacts. Right. What does that mean? What are collateral contacts? Collateral contact uh, can be uh, school personnel, not, not someone outside of the reporting party. Mm -hmm. uh, can be uh, medical professionals, can be uh, our public health nurses, it could be anyone who may have information okay. to help with the investigation. And in circumstances where as social workers we're not sure exactly what the child's condition is in terms of injuries, mm -hmm. We want to talk to as many people who may have information at that time as we can, right? In the best circumstances, absolutely. That would include, for example, um, a neurosurgeon, if a neurosurgeon had treated or seen the child? Usually, yes. Okay, that may include police officers if they investigated or actually brought the child into yes. the hospital? Yes. Okay, that would include the parents, whether they're alleged perpetrators or not? Yes. That would also include people who the parents claim had recently taken care of the child, correct? It could, yes. Okay. And as long as there is time to conduct that investigation, we don't want to just jump in and remove the child without getting a warrant, do we? Again, depends on the circumstances and the age of the infant or child. Well, if there's time to get a warrant, shouldn't we usually use that as the first option? if there is time to get a warrant and that again goes directly to the difference between time to get a warrant and exigent circumstances. Right, right. In fact the two go hand in hand, don't they? I don't know exactly how, you, how you're asking that. We well, need to go hand in hand. In other words, we want exigent circumstances before we remove a child or detain a child without a warrant. Okay, and in fact in, in your training materials, you've reviewed the civil rights training materials, correct? Yes, I have. And you've reviewed the, I think it was May 2012 warrant removals policies, yes. correct? Yes. And in those policies, and you approved of those policies, mm -hmm. correct? Yes. And in those policies, doesn't it say in black and white that if there's time to get a warrant there's not an emergency that's right okay how long does it take to get a warrant in Orange County two to four hours depending on time of day okay two to four hours so if we have two to four hours before we need to make a decision about whether or not to detain the child we should be getting a warrant shouldn't we yes we should and if we don't that would be a violation of your current policies Yes. And your current policies are based on existing Ninth Circuit law, correct? That's correct. That Ninth Circuit law that's been around since 2002, correct? I'm familiar, yes. Okay. Isn't it also true, according to your current policies that are depicted in the both the July or rather January, February civil rights training and I think it's the May 2012 civil rights training or warrant training, warrant training. that um, your social workers, before they make the decision to grab a child without a warrant, if time permits, they need to conduct a reasonable investigation to support their decision. That's true. Also, depending upon what the circumstances are at the time that they are there, what they are okay. observing. Okay. And that would be by observing, you mean, for example, observing the parents, how they interact and relate during mm -hmm. the investigation process. Right. If the parents are cooperative, that may factor into the decision. Oh, absolutely. 
if uh, the parents are seeking out and agreeing with all requested uh, medical needs, medical mm -hmm. attention, and medical diagnostics, mm -hmm. that would factor in? Yes, it would. Okay. And then again, if the social worker gets there and has two to four hours to make a decision, that would militate against a finding of exigency, correct? It's not innovative. necessarily. Okay. Not necessarily the case. Okay. Now, it's my understanding that you devise all of your policies so that you don't paint yourselves into a corner, correct? They have to have discretion, yes. Well, what, what, what do you mean when you say we devise all of our policies so that we don't paint ourselves into a corner? So that I don't want them to make rote determinations. I don't want them to be robots. That's one of the reasons why we also, I should say I'll take ownership, why I implemented the structured decision-making tool that they use so that we have consistency and ability to objectify the behaviors and information that when they're you, working with. When you say they and them, who is that? That's our social workers and supervisors. Okay. And you used a word. What was that? Uh, object Objectify? Objectify? Yes. What is that? It means that they look at it objectively. Well, you want them to look I at it I want them and not with, with, without bias. Okay. But you would agree that sometimes bias does factor into decisions that social workers make out in the field. Sometimes it does, hence the reason why I did SDM, structured decision making because mm -hmm. of human bias, human right. error. On structured decision making, that, that's essentially a list of questions, right, that the social worker will then give input to. It's not a list of questions so much as it is a list of circumstances for them to structure their interview with, if you will. But they don't ask them questions from the SDM. It helps them structure the decision. Okay. And the SDM, the investigating social worker, is the one inputting the data, correct? Yes. And if the investigating social worker has a bias, how does that get filtered out of the data? I mean, isn't it a garbage in, garbage out type situation? It can be, but it must be reviewed also by the supervisor. Okay. Which supervisor's job is to ask the first line of quality assurance, if you will. Okay. But the supervisor, and, and maybe uh, I've got it wrong, but we've deposed a couple of these guys now, at least a couple, maybe more, in many cases, not just this one. But the supervisors, don't they just read and actually just read the reports? They don't do any independent investigation, right? They don't do, a, quote, a formal independent investigation, but they should certainly be questioning the social worker as to how did you arrive at this decision and have you thought about A, B, C, or D. That is what should be going on. Okay, and what do you do in terms of policies and training and customs and practices to make sure that really does go on? That's yeah, so up to the program manager to make sure that that is actually going on and a deputy director who's over that program manager. Okay, so you just delegate that? Yes. Okay. What do you do yourself to follow up to make sure it's really happening? Meetings. We follow up with our, in our staff meetings, reviewing various policies, particularly reviewing hot topics, if you will. Uh, making sure that um, current issues that are burning issues, if you will, that we uh, are discussing. Hot topics. Hot topic could be something what's happening right now that, for example, um, hot topic could be uh, an environmental issue. It doesn't always have to be, it could be a personnel issue. So it doesn't necessarily have to be litigation at all. In fact, most of our hot topics have nothing to do with litigation. Parental rights, is that a hot topic? It's always, it's imperative. Mm -hmm. So it is a hot topic? I guess you can say that, yes. Warrantless removals, is that a hot topic? Yes, it is. And honesty in court reporting, is that a hot topic? Very much so, yes. What have you done to address those hot topics? 
First of all, as stated earlier, we train to that. Secondly, we emphasize it regularly when I have all managers meetings, which is something we do quarterly. Uh, it's all 180 or so of my managers, and we discuss how important it is to uh, be sensitive to our clients and obviously their civil rights. Always, first and foremost. Okay. Now, did you did you participate in the May 2012 training no. on warrant? I'm sorry, did you finish? Did you participate in any way in the May 2012 training on warrant procedures? No, but I was aware of it. Okay. Um, did do you recall having a meeting in, actually on May 16th of 2011, where Gary Taylor and yourself presented? I think Marcy Vreken was there as well. I remember in May, I can't say it was May 16th, but I remember that presentation, yes. Okay. How many social workers were present at that? It had to be well over 100, okay. if not more. Was that at Eckhoff? That was at Eckhoff. I think you have an auditorium there? That's correct. Okay. Is that the same one where there's the chemical spill? No, it's the other building. Oh, other, it was like across the street. A clarification was not a chemical <laughs> spill. <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> Just put that on the record. No, I'm, good. I'm, I'm not involved in that case. So don't worry about it. I have several going on right now, unfortunately. Yeah, I know. It's, it's tough when you have a big agency. Everybody's nipping at you. And I, I get it. Um, did you tell in the part of the presentation well let me make sure I got the structure right Gary Taylor presented first right and that was regarding budgets and contracts proposition 10, 13 and 16 extensions the five year taxes you remember that? Yeah I actually presented that that's what I presented that was at one of our town hall meetings mm -hmm. And what we do with the town hall meetings, to give this, uh, put this in context, we go around to each of the programs in each of the four divisions to give them program updates as to what's happening in SSA. Mm -hmm. And usually start off with budgetary issues and then pending issues, like if there's trends or patterns and things that we see that need to be corrected, that's where those meetings okay. are for. And give, and give the staff an opportunity to ask us questions without it going filtering through the system. Sure, so they have uh, like a direct connection. Right, so they can ask me anything they want. Okay. That's not personal. Right. And at that meeting you also addressed with the social workers changes that were being made to the California Child Abuse Index? Yes, khaki. Mm -hmm. And then you also addressed with that audience, the Fogarty Hardwick decision. Yes, I did. And Marcy Vreken was there present to answer questions? She was there. Actually, I didn't even know she was in the audience till afterwards, but she wasn't, she didn't, she wasn't a participant at all at, as far as presenting. She was just in the audience, and I had no knowledge that she was in the audience. So you don't remember telling the audience, just so everyone knows, Marcy is here in the room, so please be respectful when asking questions? I don't. I don't remember that, and okay. I don't think I said that. Maybe someone else said that, but I don't remember saying that. Okay. You don't remember everybody saying, I will, or anybody saying, I will try to answer your questions, but Marcy may want to take some questions directly. You don't remember that? No, not at all. Okay. You remember telling the audience words to the effect of, let me just say that Child Protective Services did absolutely nothing wrong. I did say that, yes. Okay. Hey, Sean, just for the record, what date is this meeting that you're talking about? Uh, May 16, 2011, 11 a.m. Thanks. It's a lot of insider information you have. Did you also tell the audience that, or words to the effect, 
that so long as you perform your job duties according to the PNPs, our regulations, and our regulations, you are covered, or words to that effect. Yes. Okay. And you again reminded them, we didn't do anything wrong. So the board voted to pay the damages for the individuals. Do you remember saying something like yes, that? Yes, it's along those lines, yes. Did you also tell the social workers in attendance or words to the effect that I want to inform all of you to be sure that your court reports are defendable, just the facts? Yes, I did. Be careful what goes into your reports. Don't beef up your reports. Correct. And then you reiterated that we didn't do anything wrong. I didn't realize I said it that many times. <laughs> but that sounds about right, doesn't it? Well, you're reading for something. Is it a transcript of the meeting? No, it's just my notes. <laughs> Going back to your comment, be careful what goes into your reports. Don't beef up your reports. What does that mean? That means make sure what you put in your reports is, fact, is factual and defendable. What about don't beef up your reports? What does that mean? Has to answer. That's why you just asked them. That means just put in the facts. Up just till, the facts. Up until that point in time, were you aware that social workers were regularly, quote unquote, beefing up their reports? I wasn't aware uh, on a, if you will, a pattern or trend, but because of recent litigation, that seemed to be an issue, and I wanted to make sure that that's something we do not want to do. And by recent trend, that's sort of like what the appellate court was saying in Jonathan M., mm -hmm. right? Yes. That the exaggeration of claims in court reports and juvenile dependency petitions needed to stop. Yes. Okay. If it's in fact happening, yes. Okay. Well, I mean, the appellate court. According to that one, yes, absolutely. Are you denying here today? Oh, no. Again, as I stated, I don't know anything about that case. Well, I'm asking you more generally. Are you denying here today that, in fact, your subordinates, on occasion up until at least May of 2011, had a practice of, quote, unquote, beefing up their reports? It's overbroad. No, not a practice, no. But obviously we had seen certainly some evidence of that, but I would not say it's a practice. And up until the official written training that the agency finally provided in January and February of 2012, what did you do to make sure people weren't beefing up their reports? <clears throat> Once again, working through the staff, working mm -hmm. through my deputy directors and program managers, making sure that they are doing exactly as I directed, that they are not, that our supervisor are to be reviewing the cases, the detention hearing reports, or whatever the case may be, to make sure and discussing with their social worker that what you put in here is defendable. And you can say with confidence that this is what you saw. Did you tell them to report everything, the good and the bad, or just what was defendable? It should be strength-based. In other what? words, the good as well as the bad. Okay. So did you express somewhere in writing that by defendable you meant to say both the good and the bad, the inculpatory and the exculpatory information? I don't know if I, I don't think I've sent out any email or anything to that effect, but I say oh, in several occasions in fact, when we went to the family-to-family -family model back in 2001, 2002, that was the whole premise of that, is that it be a strength-based approach, that they look at the strengths as well or as much, if not more, as they look at the current weaknesses they're investigating. And you said that you went to the team decision model back in 2001? Or, or two, or no, 1999, I think, when we actually started that. I could be wrong, but somewhere because we started the team decision making and structured decision making model pretty close to about the same time.
Was Trisha Schwen also at that meeting? Yes. Did you guys pass out any written information at that meeting? No. Do you recall telling your social workers in attendance at that meeting, look out for each other? Always, yes. What did you mean by that? To help each other out, to assist each other, to support one another. To be a team player. I guess you can say that, but not in the negative. In fact, I always say that the closure of any all of our meetings is take care of each other yourselves and be careful out there. This is what I always say. Sincerely. Is it really your position that the only reason you lost the Fogarty case is because you didn't have good attorneys? I would say that we weren't able to get all the evidence in that we would have liked and would have certainly preferred our attorney push a little bit more for that. So you don't leave any room for the possibility that, in fact, these defendants, Helen Dwojak and Marshy Vreekin, really might have lied and suppressed exculpatory evidence. You don't leave room for that possibility? I don't. And I'll tell you why I don't. Ellen Drojak, Drojak is one of the most honorable ladies that I'd ever met as far as integrity. She would have no compunction whatsoever telling me that I was wrong. She, she knew the law backwards and forwards, and she worked very closely with their staff, and there's no way in my years of working with her that she would have stood for anything like that. That's what I based it on. If it had been anyone else, maybe not so much, but I know Helen. I didn't know Marcy, but I know Helen. Well, you know Marcy now. I know her now, yes. And you have the same feelings about her. I don't know her that well. I just know her. I don't know her work. I know Helen's work. So you leave no room for the possibility that the jury in that case might have been right. Yeah, because I know Helen wouldn't do anything to falsify, purposely omit, anything, even if she knew it would jeopardize the integrity of, uh, I mean, if she knew that a social worker was doing something improper, she wouldn't do anything to cover up anything. And you know that because of your long-standing personal relationship with her? Not personal, professional, and mm -hmm. also other staff who's known her for several years who have a much longer history with her than I do. And that's the approach that you took when you investigated, or rather looked at that case too, right? That was those part blinders of it. on? No, that was part of it's it. It's argumentative. Okay. I didn't, I didn't review the case. Staff did. I didn't, I had nothing. In fact, I don't review any cases. I don't mean, I don't do any invest, internal investigations. Risk management does that, and QA does that. Okay. And risk management, they don't know Helen. Does the California Department of Social Services regularly perform compliance audits on relative assessment documentation? Yes, they do. Okay. And does your agency regularly come up short? It's vague and ambiguous. I don't know what regularly it would be. Has your agency ever come up short on one of those assessments? Oh, yes. Okay. How often? Um, I'm not certain. I probably not very often. You're talking about relative assessment for we place a child. Is that what you're speaking? I believe of? that's correct. Okay. Why is that important? Relative placement. Relative placement is extremely important because, again, going back to the 2002 family to family, my whole push and emphasis has been to keep kids out of the system, keeping them with family moving towards as opposed to removing the child from harm, let's remove the harm from the child. 
and that means if for some reason the child can't stay with the primary caregiver like the mother or the father, then we move to place that child with the relative caregiver, and we can only do that by federal and state law by assessing the home first. And in part, your agency's funding, or at least a measure of its funding, is tied to compliance with documenting your efforts oh, yes. to do, hold on, to do relevant, uh, relative placement assessments. Yes. Okay. And if you don't document it properly, properly or your social workers don't document it properly, you lose some funding. We could. Or you could we suffer could. fiscal sanctions. We could, that's true. Okay. And part of the reason that the government, the federal and state government, is tying funding and potentially sanctions to relative placement um, compliance is that's how they ensure that you actually follow the law. Your agency follows the laws. They tie some strings to it. Yes. Okay. And at least on more than one occasion, your agency has not been complying adequately with the relative placement assessments. That may be that, that happens from time to time. In many of those cases, it's a matter of they didn't check the right box. So in 2003, when the California Department of Social Services randomly sampled 110 files and found that none of those 110 files were in compliance. Was that because the social workers just checked the wrong box? That was absolutely, there's a really, yes, I can say yes, that's absolutely true because that was clarified very quickly after that. Okay, took care of that problem, never happened again. Never, well I shouldn't say never happened again, but certainly not to that level. What did you do to investigate that? Uh, first of all, I had staff go back and review exactly what happened. This happened, again, for context, this happened at a time when there really was no regulations in regards to background checks for placement. We were one of the few, if we were one of the few counties that actually had a policy in place of doing background checks before we placed. In fact, CDS, California Department of Social Services, used our template to draft the state law. But what they did is they did some things differently, unbeknownst to us, in regards, again, to it simply is a matter of, it's not so much a matter of not, check, of not doing what they're supposed to as opposed to documenting what they're supposed to do. And that was cause for a lot of the errors. Okay. I'm going to show you what we'll mark as exhibit number 137 to your deposition. Is this an email from you? Yes, it is. And it's to all Children and Family Services staff? Mm. Um, looks like a yes. Who's uh, Angelo Doty or Doty? Doty. He was, at that time, he was the director of Social Services Agency. Okay. And it's correct that when you were audited, none of the 110 files that were randomly sampled were in compliance? That's correct. <clears throat> and you told everybody that compliance is critical because essentially you're going to lose money if it's not done properly and you may be subject to fiscal sanctions. That's right. But then you went on to tell them, there's no doubt in my mind that you're all working hard to keep our children safe. And for that, I'm quite appreciative. Yes. And that you are also acutely aware that there's a great deal being asked of your workers. Mm hmm That's yes? Yes. Okay. And then you say, yet you continue to perform well. Yes. Was that your opinion in light of the fact that not a single file complied with statutory mandates in the audit? They were doing, they continued to perform well? That uh, was in the context of keeping kids safe, yes. 
Okay, so they continued to perform well even though they were not complying with statutory mandates. And the statutory mandate, again, <coughs> in this particular case, particularly after further discussions with the California Department of Social Services, again, it was minor, but yet and still okay. it was not properly checked. Okay, so, so my question was, in your view, they continued to perform well even though they were not complying with statutory mandates? Asked and answered. They continue to perform well in regards to keeping kids safe and families together. Yes, that was, that was my intent. Well, where does it say keeping uh, that you continue to perform well in keeping families together and keeping kids safe? It's in the overall context of child welfare, okay. child protection services. In the first sentence you read. Okay. But what you actually said here in black and white is, quote, yet you continue to perform well, end quote, correct? Yes, that's correct. Okay. Those are clerical issues. Sure they are, not documenting whether or not we've done relative assessment reviews or clerical issues. It was a clerical issue in regard to not checking the correct boxes. Yes, that's correct. Okay, do you leave room for the possibility that in fact the workers, the reason that they were leaving those boxes unchecked was because they were not properly conducting reviews of relative placement assessments. We reviewed all 110 of those cases just in case, just and, to be sure. And you spoke to the social workers who were in charge of those cases? I spoke to their managers, yes. You spoke to their managers? Their deputies and managers to make sure that those 100, 110 cases were in fact that the kids were not placed in harm's way or place was denied because of something that was improper. Well, we're talking about relative placement of right. children. Mm -hmm. Did you speak with the workers that were in charge of check marking those boxes to see whether or not they in fact had done the statutorily mandated assessment? They did not speak to the social workers, no. Okay. You spoke to the program director? The program managers, yes. Okay. And the deputy directors, is correct. Okay. And you believed what they told you? They told me the truth, that they had not done that, but once doing the review, yes, I believe what they told me. Okay. Did they show you documentation to prove that the relative placement assessment had actually been done? Yes, they have. Yes, they did. Okay. And what form is that? There's some form associated with going out and identifying and investigating relative placement, right? There's a form, and of course, and there's, there's a field in regards to the CWS, CMS, Child Welfare Services Case Management System that they input that information into. Okay. I didn't see all of them, no. And does your agency maintain statistics on that? They must, because funding's tied to it. Yes. Okay. What would we call that statistic if we were to send you a request for production and ask you to give us that number? I assume it would be relative assessments. I don't know what else it would be called. Okay. And that data is actually kept at Berkeley. Okay. Because the CWS CMS system is a state operated uh, central system, correct? Yes. Okay. Now, what, uh, as the head of the agency, the go-to guy where the buck stops. What is your policy regarding document retention and destruction? As far as document retention is for most, if not all, child welfare cases, those cases are actually held for several years. I thought it was 10 plus years, but I could be wrong. I don't know the exact time, but they certainly are to retain records. Plus, they maintain, they're maintained in CWS CMS for quite some time. Okay. How about emails? There's no, there's no if you, expectation or policy that says you must keep emails for any certain amount of time. Does your agency, if you know, archive your employees' email transmissions? We can if we have reason to believe that the social worker or any staff is is using the um, county uh, equipment improperly, yes, we can do that. Do you do it? Um, no, we don't. Okay. Only when we feel as though that there's, let me go back, when you say archive or to, when you say archive where you just automatically kept on a server, you mean, or yeah. something like that? Yeah. No. Okay. 
How about monitor? Do you monitor and then archive email transmissions? We don't monitor them per se, but uh, it's up to the supervisors, if you will, to monitor from time to time, yes, email transmissions. That's how we find out when someone has, is using the system improperly. Okay, so every now and then you will like do a random spot monitoring or something just to watch people? Particularly based upon if we have reason to believe they're doing something wrong. Okay. Uh, what about with regard to other documents? For example, documents generated during team decision meetings. As far as reviewing those, me reviewing them or my staff reviewing them? No, the policies and practices that you have at your agency regarding retaining those documents as opposed to destroying those documents. Is that the information or that summary that is gleaned from that meeting should be placed in CWS CMS. What about other documents that are produced at those meetings, perhaps by the parents or relatives or the people that show up to support the parents? That would be under discretion of the TDM facilitator, if you felt it was pertinent or not. Okay, so there's no policy that you have in place to require that a team decision meeting facilitator, for example, retain documents that are exculpatory in nature. Yes, that and all pertinent information, absolutely. What are you doing to enforce that policy to make sure that really does happen? And Again, it, same review process. If we have a reason to believe that's not happening, to go back and review that particular facilitator. So if a facilitator, for example, it came to your attention that a facilitator took a piece of butcher paper that described in detail the condition and cause of a child and then promptly shredded it and did not include it in his report, would that be something that might suggest him to dis or, or suggest discipline to I'm that not facilitator? Aware it, it lacks foundation. I'm, I'm not aware of any such action. And it's an incomplete okay. hypothetical too. Have you yourself ever instructed your subordinates to destroy written materials? No. Have you yourself ever instructed your subordinates to delete emails, for example? No. Unless, of course, they have no absolute nothing to do with any case currently under litigation or if they feel the case is going to be under litigation. Then you would tell your supervisors or your subordinates to... Hold on, hold on. I want to make sure I understood that. Just so that I'm clear, you would instruct your subordinates to delete emails if, for example, there was, they felt there was a case that's going to be under litigation. No, let me clarify. Okay. What Got I'm, me all excited okay. there. Okay. <laughs> what I'm saying, what I'm saying is, first of all, I don't ever remember telling anybody to do anything with their emails, to be very honest with you. Mm -hmm. Secondly, um, in within the context that um, that you're just that you're talking about is in in order to keep one case file that that worker whatever notes that they may have written down and they have taken what they feel the pertinent information and put in that case file so that we have the one file and not drop files that though that information no longer is 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 relevant because I'm assuming again an assumption here that they put everything in their notes in other words they're not to have two different cases Okay. One case over here and the case in CWS CMS. That's what that was pertaining to. Certainly nothing at all to do with deleting or hiding or omitting anything with okay. any case. Okay. And just so I'm perfectly clear on what you're telling me here today, or telling all of us here today, you have never instructed any employee of Social Services Agency in Orange County or any of your subordinates at Orange County to delete or destroy emails? 
Yeah. You know what? EA funding is emergency assistance funding. Okay, what does that refer to? Emergency assistance funding refers to funding that is under Title Four B that you get, for example, when. Um, um, it's been a while here, but it has to do with um, when kids are, uh, say, brought into Orangewood, mm -hmm. for the most part. But that's part of the only part of the funding. Okay, and how does that work? Well, once a child is brought into Orangewood, then there is a certain amount that um, uh, funding that is um, acquired for that to for the care of that child. And that comes from what, the federal or state government? It comes from the state, but also with some Fed money in it. Okay. And that uh, funding, the statistic that is driven by is the number of children brought into Orangewood, correct? Yes, it's driven by caseload, if you will. Okay. Well, that's the number well, the of the number, number of kids that are brought into Orangewood. Okay. So if there are no children brought into Orangewood, there is no Title IV B funding. Not necessarily the case, no. Okay, there is other title fundings under Title The whole purpose of Title IV B funding is early intervention prevention services, which differs from Title IV E funding, which pays for group home and foster care funding. Okay. So the IV E funding would be the general overhead for the operation of the facility, whether you have children there or not. For the most part, okay. yeah, would, yes. Okay. And then the 4B funding is specifically tied to the number of children brought into Orangewood. More directly, and also I should add that 4B funding also is the funding that we get to, for contract services. In other words, when we vendorize our services, that money goes for the most part primarily to the community. Like for foster family agencies, it could be not necessarily for, because that's primarily Title IV E, but for, say, ancillary services or enhancements that would pay for those kind, like, like IPP, individual private providers. Okay. Where does Orangewood get its funding? It gets its funding as a combination, mm -hmm. a combination of EA, combination of county, just uh, mm -hmm. county general fund money, mm -hmm. and child welfare services money. So it's a combination. Okay, and the child welfare services money, that's state and federal? That's state and federal, yes. And the 4B funding is state and federal? That's state and federal as well. And the 4E funding is also state and yes, federal? Yes, it is. Okay. And as we're pulling more children in, I, I, I suppose there's an ebb and flow, right? If there's not a lot of kids coming in, then there's not a lot of need. When there are a lot of kids coming in, there's more need, right? Yes. And the funding's tied directly to that ebb and flow, at least under 4B, right? The money is tied to that, but it's capped. How's it capped? It's capped based upon your your funding base on prior years. In other words, let's say that you spend ten dollars a year. So therefore, for the following year, your base now would be ten dollars. So therefore, if you go over that, that's as far as money you're going to get for it. So that means the county now has to kick in any extra money that you go over your cap. The state no longer puts any money into that. Mm -hmm. And then the converse is also true. If you don't use your whole $10 in one year, the state will take away for next year the unused balance. Yes, and that lowers your base. Right, mm -hmm. right. <clears throat> and as to the cap, it's not just the county that's going to pick up that tab. There's also grants available and other federal funds to fill some of that gap. Yes, that's true. And also depending on the funding stream, mm -hmm. it can be a 50, even though the state pulls it money, its money out, the Fed still will provide 50% of it, but now the county provides the other 50% because the state has pulled theirs out. Got it. And all of that is still tied to the number of children being brought into Orangewood? It's tied to the number of children we have in the foster care system. Orangewood okay. is a part of that. Okay. <clears throat> okay. 
Now for that EA funding, you're required to make reports. Your agency is required to make reports to the administrating state and federal governments, correct? Yeah, we have all kinds of forms we have to submit. Okay. Are those forms attested to by anybody under penalty of perjury? Any form that we send, I would think so. I mean, cool. the whole point of sending forms to the state and to the feds is for, obviously, veracity. In other words, and if we're, when we're audited, they find otherwise, just like you found with the relative assessment, mm -hmm. we would be uh, under a corrective action plan or sanctioned or something, yes. Who is it that's charged with the responsibility of actually signing those reports under penalty of perjury? Um, it would depend, I would imagine, probably either the, the chief deputy director, the director, or the director, <clears throat> okay. either one of those. And now those, those reports, because they're specifically tied to the funding that your agency is going to get from mm -hmm. the state and federal government, those are official reports. Yes, they are. And it's really important that they be accurate, complete, truthful, and honest, right? right. That's correct. Because the federal and state governments are going to rely on the information in those reports when they decide how much money to give your county. That's right. Okay. So when you go through and fill those out, it's really critical that you're careful not to overstate. Absolutely. Okay. And you don't want to understate because if you do, you'll lose money. We have been known to understate, that's for sure. Okay. But, and, but what you're saying, the importance of accuracy is mm -hmm. critical. Because federal and state governments are going to be making critical funding decisions based on what you're telling them. Yes. So you always want to be truthful, accurate, and honest in that reporting. Yes. You've never signed any one of those reports, have you? I may have. I don't remember signing any of them. Okay. I signed a lot of reports. Okay. That probably is signed by the Director of Administration. Who is that? Right now it's Carol Weisman. At that time it would have been... 2010? 2010. Um, at the time we didn't have one. Okay, so there was nobody signing the report? No, probably went to, at that time, Mike Ryan then, who was the Chief Deputy Director. Okay. Would you have reviewed that report before you signed it? Um, I would, yeah, I would have. And you would have approved of it before you signed it and sent it in? Yeah, because the numbers there don't mean anything to me because I don't have any of the context. So I'll look at the numbers to see if, if it makes sense within the patterns and trends of past years. Mm -hmm. But I have to rely on my staff that those numbers are true and, and accurate. Sure, because it's a big agency. You have a lot of uh, clients. Mm -hmm that you have to deal with, and you couldn't yourself possibly go down and review every single one. No. You have to rely on your people. Have to. And you have to trust them. Yes, I do. Because okay. when you look at each and every month, we serve approximately 475,000 clients. That's a lot of clients. Yes, it is. Did the state ever come down and censure your agency for overstating its EA numbers? Not that I'm aware of. Who is Nathan Nishimoto? Uh, in 2010 or 2009, he would have been a deputy director in Children and Family Services. Now he's currently the director over our family self-sufficiency. But he was a director of... A deputy director. A deputy director of Family and Children's Services in 2010, correct? Yes, that's correct. And also in 2009, correct? Yes. Mm -hmm. And he would have been one of your subordinates then? Yes. Reporting directly to you? He would have been reporting directly to the Director of Children and Family Services, which what? at that time would have been uh, Mike Ryan or Gary Taylor. Okay, yeah, that's right. I got it. And then they report to, to you. Me. Mm -hmm. okay. And you, do you recall ever telling Gary Taylor and Mike Ryan to delete or destroy if emails have been printed 
all emails you have in your inbox or personal folder from me dated December 3rd, 2009? No. Okay, I'm going to show you what we'll mark as Exhibit 138 to your deposition. I don't remember this at all. You don't remember? Why, de why December 3rd? I don't, I don't remember this conversation at all. I'd have to go back and touch base with Gary and uh, Nathan. Well, you should probably do that because I'm going to notice their depositions next. Okay. Was there ever a time in December 2009 that you remember anybody overestimating? Your EA claim? No, not ever. No, I mean, not ever. And once it was discovered, you don't recall telling Gary Taylor and Mike Ryan to request that we delete or destroy, if email printed, all emails you have in your inbox or personal folder from me dated December 3rd, 2009. You don't remember that? I don't remember that at all. I mean, I honestly do not remember that. And if even if I said such a thing, it wouldn't be in context with any EA report. Well, why not? The EA report is what drives your funding, isn't it? Yeah, but I wouldn't do anything to obviously interfere with that. Mm -hmm. I don't know what I don't, I, even though I see the subject matter is emergency assistance claims. But <coughs> no, absolutely not. I'm going to take a little break for the restroom. You might want to take a minute to review the context of the email. I'm going to ask you some questions about it. Okay. We're going off the record. This is the end of disc two. The time is 2.15 p.m. We're back on the record. This is the beginning of disc three. The time is 2.34 p.m. So you're familiar with Welfare and Institutions Code Section 600, correct, or 601? Yes, generally, yes. Yeah, well, you became more specifically familiar with that in the McFetridge trial, correct? That's correct. And just briefly, what is your understanding of the import of Welfare and Institutions Code Section 600? Uh, you have to refresh my memory on exactly what that code is. Okay, wasn't that the code section that gives your agency authority to intervene on behalf of a parent when they have an unruly child? That, oh, I see. Yes, that's true. Okay, but your agency does not normally do that, even when a parent requests that you intervene and help them deal with an unruly child, correct? That's correct. That's been, that would be the, I believe what they call the 601, the WIT code 601 cases. Right. And at that time, <clears throat> before I even arrived, it was a, de a determination that was made that would no longer be involved with those cases. So even though the California legislature made provision in Welfare and Institutions Code Section 601 permitting your agency to intervene and give a parent help when they had an unruly child, your agency decided that you wouldn't do that. It's argumentative. Did I understand you correctly? My understanding is that um, there was some legislation, I can't think of the number right now, that for the most part uh, prohibited, prohibited us, in other words, child welfare agencies, to intervene just because a parent asks for help unless there is uh, a danger to the child for the most part. But as far as I know, in my 17 years or 16 years of being at the agency, there's never been a case unless the parent, of course, left the kids alone. 
or unsupervised. So is it your testimony here today that your agency is not permitted by law to intervene at the request of a parent under Welfare and Institutions Code 601? I'm Am I understanding saying, you? I'm not saying that. I'm saying that I thought there was, but I'd have to go back and check. But I do know as a practice, we do not. Okay, and the reason you do not is because there is no funding for it, correct? Uh, if we brought a child into protective custody, there would be funding for it. Okay, but you could only bring a child into protective custody under Welfare and Institutions Code Section 300. That's correct. You... So I'm correct then, aren't I, that if you intervene on behalf of a parent under Welfare and Institutions Code Section 601, there is no funding. However, if well, we... Well, wait a minute. The, the question was... I understand you may have an explanation, but let's get an answer to the question. So I'm correct then, aren't I, that if you intervene on behalf of a parent under Welfare and Institutions Code Section 601, there is no funding, state or federal, available to your agency. That is my understanding, yes. So the county would cover that bill? Yes. And I think you've testified earlier that as a matter of policy, your agency does not intervene in those situations. That is, situations arising under Welfare and Institutions Code Section 601, where there's, for example, an unruly child that a parent has trouble controlling. That's correct. I don't know of any county that does. Okay, but your county certainly doesn't. That's correct. And that's been the case ever since you have been in charge at the agency? And it's been the case before I even arrived. Okay, and you continued to follow that policy? Yes. Okay. It opened up a whole new class of cases for you and your buddies, Sean. Okay. You know, we all got to make a living. <laughs> They're not all my buddies. A lot of them are. How do you go about in your agency determining whether or not a social worker should be promoted? How are they evaluated and promoted or demoted? It's based on their performance. It's based on the performance evaluations of their supervisor, and it's also determined, it's based on uh, their MQs, which is min minimal qualifications. In other words, before they can actually apply for recruitment that we have, they must meet that, that threshold. And then there's a written exercise, and then there are interviews. Okay. I want to go back just for a moment. You said that it's in part at least, driven by their performance? Yes, in part. Okay. What statistic is it that you're looking for when you're talking about performance? As far as it's uh, broken out into exceeds, um, um, meets, uh, and needs improvement. Well, those are the different levels of classification when we're looking at performance, level, right? Right, level of grade, if you will, okay. A, B, or C. But what's the actual matrix, the, the data that we're looking for when we're evaluating a social worker's performance? The timeliness of their visits. They have to make, uh, make sure that, they're, that they actually are seeing the kids once a month as required. Um, the timeliness of their court reports and the accuracy of those court reports. What else? Uh, and then their overall professional demeanor, deportment, if you will. Okay, looking at the accuracy of their court reports, 
how do we go about assessing that? That would be assessed by the supervisor. And how does the supervisor assess that if they never actually investigate the data in the underlying report? They should be, let's put it like this, they don't investigate. They obviously have to rely on their social worker. And what they do is when the social worker submits this report, it is uh, incumbent upon the supervisor to read that and ask questions. County Council also is involved in that process. Oh, County Council's involved in asking questions and investigating? Not investigating, but certainly asking questions because they're the ones that represent us in the courtroom. Well, the County Council doesn't actually represent the social workers. The social represents workers. The county. Right. Mm -hmm. The social workers themselves are witnesses. Right, that's correct. All right. They're not prosecutors. No, no, not at all. Yeah, you have County Council for that function. Right. And it's county council that makes the ultimate decision whether to litigate a case or dismiss it, right? Yeah, he takes or she takes the information, makes a determination from there, yes. Okay. And he has to, of course, rely on the information given to him or her by your social workers, right? That's correct. Okay. So again, any decision that county council make is necessarily going to be driven by the information your people provide. It's going to, yes, it is. And it's the same sort of situation as with structured decision making. If we get garbage in, we'll get garbage out. And that's one way of saying it, yes. Okay. And we don't have at Orange County Social Services Agency any direct mechanism in place to verify the honesty, accuracy, and completeness of the information that the line worker puts in their report. We rely on them to be honest, right? It's big and ambiguous. We rely on the supervisor to make sure that that information that that social worker puts in is legitimate and accurate. And what's the supervisor supposed to do to do that? Sit down and go over and interview that information. And, once, and sometimes the supervisor actually will talk with the parent on the phone or if the parent happens to be there or bring the parent in to discuss as my program managers do from time to time. Is there a uh, written policy somewhere that requires supervisors to periodically call or contact the collateral witnesses in a particular case? Not collateral. Only the parents? The parents. Okay. And would that be a direct contact or through counsel? No, that's a direct contact. Okay. How frequently is that supposed to happen? Um, about every six months, something like that. How many cases do they do every six months? How many cases does it should the, be. Hold on, hold on. How many cases is the supervisor required to review at that level every six months? I don't know the number they're required to review. I just know that every six months per, if they have seven social workers in their unit, which typically they do, they are to be following up with the parents or the caregiver, seeing that the social worker has been there, has been professional, has been helpful, and all of that. As far as how many cases they actually review, that I do not know. Do you keep statistics on that? No. Do you keep statistics on the number of times that a supervisor in one of those reviews finds a discrepancy? If there, no, we don't keep statistics of, but if that discrepancy warrants disciplinary action, we're at that, yes. And whether or not the discrepancy warrants dis disciplinary action obviously is something that is more or left, less left to the discretion of the supervisor, since they're the ones doing the review. If they find a discrepancy, they are obliged or obligated to tell the program manager, and then the program manager will let uh, human resources know and do an investigation. And what does the program manager under your regime do to make sure that the supervisors are reporting what should be reported. Again, meeting with them on a regular basis to make sure that they're doing, again, what they're supposed to be doing and following up that their workers are, in fact, following policies and procedures. And has that been the case since January 2009? Uh, I hope that's been the case since before, way before that, as, well, far as, uh, as far as what, as far as expectation, again, going back to even the training and our earlier policies and procedures, it states in there that they are to present 
accurate information and not falsify or omit any, in, any uh, evidence. You done? Yes. Okay. You said you hope that's the case. Yes. Okay. Since when have these policies and procedures of investigating your workers and following up with supervisors and program directors, since when have those policies and procedures been in place? And those policies and there are those are not policies and procedures. Well, what are they if they're not policies and procedures? This practice to make sure that they're following up on the policies okay. and procedures. Okay. And there's nothing in writing that defines for them the way that they're to go about that practice? No. That's just something that you have an expectation that they would do? Yes. And we know, don't we, Mr. Riley, that some of that expectation has not been realized, right? Sometimes that's the case. In fact, it has not been realized in enough instances that the appellate court in Orange County has twice instructed your agency to take a very close look at its practices, policies, mm -hmm. and procedures, correct? Yes. Once, actually twice in 2010, correct? Mm-hmm. Yes. yes. And both of those instances related to dishonesty in court reporting or sworn court petitions? Yes. Okay. What have you done in recent history, like the last two years, for example, to just make even more certain that your social workers are being honest in their are honest, complete, and accurate? Because you agree with me that. Absolutely. Even in their petitions, they have to be honest, complete, and accurate. Right. Because they sign those under penalty of perjury. Absolutely. Those are official documents, right? Right. The court is going to rely on those statements to make decisions, right? That's right. Decisions that impact families. Right. Can tear families apart, in fact. They can, yes. So it's critical that when your social workers sign those petitions under penalty of perjury, the information in there is true and correct. That's right. That it's accurate. Right. That it's complete. Right. Meaning we don't leave things out. Right. We don't leave out critical exculpatory information that a judge might need to look at to get the whole story. That's correct. And if a social worker did do that, would they be subject to discipline? If they did that with intent and malice to do so, absolutely. And how would you go about figuring out whether or not they had intent or malice we as would, their supervisor? We would do uh, what well, the supervisor wouldn't do, an investigation. The QA would do the investigation and review and determine it from there and to look at the whole case in context and interview everyone who had anything to do with that case okay. as far as staff. And you would agree with both me and the appellate court that it would be improper ethically, legally, and constitutionally for a social worker to exaggerate claims in their sworn petition. If they are actually exaggerating or they're perceiving it, there's a difference as far as I'm concerned. But if they're purposely exaggerating it to, like you said, to beef up, then that would be improper, yes. Well, how about if they are exaggerating it or overstating it, or beefing up for the purpose of frightening the parents into submitting to jurisdiction on other counts. Absolutely wrong, yes. Okay. But you would agree with me that that does in fact happen with social workers in your agency? I would agree, at least that's been a perception, it's been the findings, and any time I find out a social worker is doing that, I will discipline them, him or her, and when they have, they have been terminated. How many social workers have you disciplined or terminated specifically for beefing up allegations in a juvenile dependency pet petition as an attempt to frighten the parents into submitting to jurisdiction on other counts? It lacks foundation. Well, you I, just told I me. Don't. I just want to know how many. Well, 
He told you that he was aware of the first part of it. You added a lot more to it. I'm, foundation. A, I'm aware of the three that I terminated. Okay. And those, all three of them were within the last three years? Uh, I would say within the last five, certainly. So are you going to go take a look at this Jonathan M. and see what happened there? Yes, I will. Absolutely. As a favor to me, I hope you can the people that did this. I will certainly look into that because just reading that obviously doesn't look good. Right. Now, have you taken steps in recent years, specifically since 2010, to teach your social workers what is meant by the phrase exculpatory evidence? No, I have not, not specifically exculpatory evidence. Have you requested that any of your subordinates, Mike Ryan or Gary Taylor or anybody, promulgate some training or policies specifically tailored to educating your social workers what is meant by the term exculpatory evidence. That is, our, that is in the training and it has been for a while. The term is even in there. Which one? Exculpatory. Is in which training? Uh, the, the first, their first year training in that with law and ethics piece okay. module. Okay. Do you also teach them that they have an absolute duty to disclose to the juvenile court, not to the parents, because obviously the parents already know the exculpatory evidence, right? Mm -hmm. That's yes. Uh, yes. So do you teach your social workers that they have an absolute duty to disclose to the juvenile court exculpatory evidence? Yes. Okay. And you've done that for sure since January and February 2012, right? That's in the training. So what is exculpatory evidence? Uh, my understanding is that pertinent evidence that you know that is has direct impact on findings. Okay. You understand that there's a difference between written policies and the actual practices that are employed in the field, correct? That will occur, I'm sure, from time to time as far as when you look at our policies, mm -hmm. oftentimes it is stated that they are guidelines. Mm -hmm. okay. But you don't expect your social workers to deviate from the guidelines substantially. No, I do not. Okay. So for example, I think you just gave me an example earlier that as a matter of policy, when a social worker fills out a juvenile detention, or rather juvenile dependency petition that they attest to under penalty of perjury, they're required to tell the truth in it, the whole truth, nothing but the truth, meaning they don't beef things up, mm -hmm. right? That's right. And they don't leave things out. Yes. Okay. But in practice, they may not actually follow that policy, right? That's... I can't say that because I don't know that for sure in all cases. Okay. And you haven't yourself undertaken any investigation to, to determine whether or not, as a matter of custom, your social workers actually follow what you've expressed as your policy? Absolutely, I have. By meeting with our um, QA team, meeting with all of my managers and deputies to make sure that they're going back and following up and making certain that our social workers are following the policies and procedures and not deviating from them. I gotta get used to using this follow button. Mm -hmm. You know, I think 
They may have kicked off the AC. I'm getting kind of warm too. It's really warm in here. Yeah. Well, I thought that was by design. Kind of like the sweat light. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, I liked it better this morning, but it was cool. Okay. I just want to make sure I'm clear on something because okay. the explanation you just gave me is causing me a little confusion. You just told me that as a matter of policy, and that's your policy. No, I'm sorry. As a matter of what I do, as a matter of practice, no policy written for what I did, for what I do. No, there's no policy written. In, as, in essence, for example, it just goes without saying that if you're going to be a manager or a supervisor in any of the county programs, you're the first line of quality assurance, making sure that your staff is following our laws, our regulations, and policies and procedures. Mm -hmm. But that's not necessarily written anywhere outside of in one's job description where you're responsible for what happens in your agency program unit, whatever the case may be. Okay, so it's the supervisor that is, in essence, your, as the, the head of the agency, your um, eyes and ears and enforcement arm to make sure that your expectations and policies are being met. That's correct. Okay. So am I correct then also that if the line workers believe your policy is something that other than what you've told me here today, that there's a breakdown in communication between you and the supervisor, not necessarily between you and the actual line worker? That the way you characterize that, that would be a breakdown in communication, yes, if they actually saw okay. it differently than our policy and procedure. Okay. And what would you do, if that were the case, what would you do to address that problem? We address it all the time through re-education, through training, um, through, again, a, what we do is when we have like our all managers meetings, mm -hmm. and we also have a meeting where we sit down and discuss just with the um, upper management staff, the deputy directors, talking about areas that we see that need to be retrained, enhanced, tweaked, modified, whatever. And it's through that medium is where all of these other kinds of things, like for, for example, the warrant, the new warrant policies, or anything along those lines, we see there's a trend or pattern that the staff is not understanding or is confused, then we go back and reintroduce what we want them to be doing. Okay. Would you do me a personal favor and do a new set of training on how important it is to be honest, accurate, complete in court reports and in the juvenile dependency petitions? But this is this is outside the context of litigation. Don't, don't answer the question. We can talk about that off the record. We'll be glad to talk about that off the record. And I won't be bringing that up. You don't have to worry about that. I'm going to mark as Exhibit 139 to your deposition. What looks to be a policy statement of some sort. I'll ask you to spend a little bit of time and just sort of look through it. I've seen it. Okay, can you describe for us what Exhibit 139 is? When I saw it, it looks to be under the employee liability section of training, again, emphasizing the importance of them not fabricating and the and obviously not committing perjury. Mm -hmm. Do you know the date that this policy was first promulgated? I do not. There seems to be something redacted on the bottom. Do you know what that is? I don't. Mm, I don't. How would you go about finding out when this particular policy was first promulgated? I will go back to my PDU staff, which is Program Development Unit. They're the ones that write the policies, 
and find out when this was actually written. Now, is there training of some kind associated with each and every written policy? Not with each and every written policy, but within, if you will, the general parameters, understanding of what those policies, because several policies, for, for the most part, deal with the same concept, if you will. So therefore, we deal with those concepts. Say, for example, again, with investigations and with doing re court reports, that applies to emergency response worker, dependency investigation worker, and a family reunification worker. Mm -hmm. it, it goes across the board, so not just specifically, even though it may state that the ER worker do this, it also applies to any of our social workers. Okay. Do you know whether or not there is a specific training program that was either related to or incorporated this uh, government code section 820.21 policy? Yes, I believe that's in the Public Child Welfare Training Academy modules, but I have to verify that. Okay, and did you bring those here with you today? I, think I you didn't bring them. I don't have anything with me. I have the documents that I gave you. Or... Right, those are the documents that he's yes, producing? That he's producing. Mm -hmm. Do you know whether he brought those here with him Those today? training modules from the Public Welfare Training Center. modules, are, okay. yes. Okay, if I were to give you those, would you be able to locate for me um, where in there we have specific training relating to um, the obligations of social workers as laid out in Government Code Section 820.21? I, I can certainly try. Okay, let's do that. Going off the record. Yeah, this might take a while. Going off the record, the time is 3.03 p.m. Oh, We're back in the record. The time is 3.20 p.m. Okay, Mr. Riley, before we went off the record, what we were uh, concerned about or looking for, prior to training anyway, was to pin down the date when Exhibit 139 was promulgated. Yes. And in reviewing the box of documents that you brought with us here today, we located a three-page document that you produced for us and that I've marked as exhibit number 140, and I'm handing you okay. my only copy of that. Actually. Okay. And can you identify for me what that is? This is a document that is listed under the defense of employees or employees liability policy in regards to them uh, ensuring that they are not falsifying information. Okay. And is there any way looking at that document that we can tell when the, the policy set out there was promulgated? This was 5-12-2012. Does, or are you talking about which does one? Does this tell you that what date it was printed or what date it was promulgated? Because I notice it's next to a website address. I yes. just want to make sure. If you know that, go ahead and tell them that. But if you don't know that, I don't want you to misstate when that was promulgated. That's a good question. I'll have to verify that. I, um, well, let me ask you this way. Verify. Let me ask you this way. Let me see it real quick. Sure. Do you have any reason, well, let me ask you first, this web address, http forward slash forward slash admin slash pnps, that's policies and procedures, right? That's our intranet. Okay. And that admin, that's who? That's the ad admin division who puts out those PNPs. Okay. So they're the ones that are in charge of putting together the policies and procedures and then disseminating them to the workers. PDU is the one that puts it together. Mm -hmm. They send it to the IT folks to put it on the website. Okay. And on this one here, May 1st, 2012, would that be when this policy first appeared on the intranet? That's very possible, yes. Okay. And this policy was tied to, what did I do with it? Oh, there we go. Was tied to the training that was provided by Carolyn Frost 
titled Juvenile Court Roles and Responsibilities, correct? Yes, correct. And specifically, oh, the pages aren't numbered. Their slides. Yeah. Okay, what I'm going to do just for ease of getting back to it in the record, it's The 11th page from the end of the document is titled Juvenile Court Roles and Responsibilities, Building a Good Reputation in Your Court Report Continued, right? Yes. And that was continued from the 12th page back or forward from the back of the document titled Juvenile Court Roles and Responsibilities, Building a Good Reputation in Your Court Report, correct? Correct. And this is also a training that was provided um, to your social workers. It's a new training that was provided to your social workers in May 2012, correct? Yes, that's correct. Okay, and this training was tailored to specifically, at least in part, specifically address the requirement that social workers be fair, honest, accurate, and complete in their reporting to the court, correct? Yes. Okay. This May 1st policy that we have attached to your deposition as exhibit number 140, is this now currently an accurate policy statement of your agency? Yes, it is. Okay, and the policy says that under government code section 820.21, notwithstanding any other provision of the law, the civil immunity of juvenile court social workers, child protection workers, and other public employees authorized to initiate or conduct investigations or proceedings pursuant to, and then it gives a list of the code citations, mm -hmm. shall not extend to any of the following if committed with malice. And then your policy lists perjury, yes. fabrication of evidence, yes. failure to disclose known exculpatory evidence, yes. and obtaining testimony by duress. Yes. Okay. And it's your understanding, you, you reviewed this policy before it was published, correct? Yes. And you approved it? Yes. Okay. And it's your understanding under this policy that you reviewed and approved that malice is also defined by statute, correct? Let me clarify that. Uh, Gary Taylor approved that, the Director of Children and Family Services. Okay, you did not approve it? I did it? not approve it, but, it's, but he has authority to do that. Okay, you've delegated that authority yes. to him. Yes. Okay, and he approved this new policy statement, as far as you know, in May 2012. Yes. Did he discuss it with you before he approved it? Yes. Okay, and we you were... I'm sorry. Do you discuss all new policies with Mr. Taylor? No, not all new policies. Okay, but you discussed this one. We discussed not that one specifically, but again, the general topic, yes. Okay, and that was all in or around the April-May 2012 timeframe? Yes. And prior to May 2012, your agency did not have a specific 820.21 policy, did it? As far as I'm aware, we did not. Okay. And you also did not have any training specifically tailored to the provisions of 820.21? Not specifically to that government code. Okay. And in part, that's because, and I think you're not alone in this, Larry Lehman said the same thing, but let me just get to it. In part, that's because you wouldn't expect to have to tell your social workers to be honest. That's correct. You wouldn't expect to have to tell them to be accurate. Right. You wouldn't expect to have to tell them to be complete. 
Right. Because the reports they're filling out are official court reports. Correct. The court is going to be taking those documents and the words and information in those documents and make heavy decisions. Correct. And it's critical for the parents and the children involved that those decisions be based on true, honest, accurate, and complete information. Absolutely. And yet we know for fact that sometimes, at least up until January of 2012, social workers did not tell the truth in their reports. It's overbroad. I do know that in some circumstances, some instances, there certainly appears to have been exaggeration. And yet it took until 2012 to promulgate specific policies and training. That misstates the testimony. His testimony is with regard to that specific code section. You can answer the question. It is my understanding, as you had stated prior, that I would not have to say it, promulgate it. If you are reporting to a judge, you are working with, uh, within a courtroom, it's implicit that you are being truthful, factual. And added to that, the fact that you are working with families and the, if you will, the power that you have to be able to either keep that family together or to break that family up, that your report, your investigation be thorough, truthful, and honest. It's a lot of power. Yes, it is. And until fairly recently, social workers had absolute immunity, didn't they? Yes. Mm -hmm. Meaning that they could essentially do anything they wanted, including abuse their power without reprisal. That I didn't know until that new regulation. I always felt that or thought that if they're acting outside the scope of their assignment or work, that they would be liable. And I held them to that okay. standard. Well, we when know I that when in, I discovered it. We know that in Jonathan M, these social workers weren't held to that standard, it right? Goes, it calls for speculation. They may be now that you know about the I case. Have to, you have to find out. You have to go back and find out. Like I said, I did not know. Honestly, did not know that case until you presented it here. Okay. We know also that in uh, Tyler H., the social workers weren't held to that standard. Also a 2010 case. It calls for speculation. Um, I'm vaguely familiar with that case, but I can't answer what happened with that. And we know that in Fogarty Hardwick, the social workers weren't held to that standard because you believe, even today, that they did not exaggerate, lie, or deceive the court. Yes, I do. Now, going back to that May 2011 town hall meeting where you appeared with uh, Gary Taylor and talked to the workers there, did you explain to any of them that there was no coverage for any punitive damage claim that might be awarded against them? that it would be something left solely to the discretion of the county as to whether or not to indemnify them. Yes, I did. And did some of those social workers raise a concern about that? I'm sure they probably did. They didn't with me, but I'm sure afterwards I'm certain they did. But so they... None, of, none of the social workers at that meeting specifically raised their hand and asked you words to the effect of, so what, should we go out and buy our own insurance? Oh, okay. Yes. Yes, someone did ask that question. Mm -hmm. And my response was, again, if you're working within the scope of your duties, 
you will be indemnified by the county, by the Board of Supervisors. However, I also emphasize that it's not a guarantee the board must approve it. Well, if the social workers are adequately trained and understand their duties, why would they have a question about whether or not they should buy their own insurance? I don't have an answer to that. That's a good question. I don't know. And a good number of the social workers at that meeting, that town hall meeting, were concerned about that, right? Yes, they were. It's vague and ambiguous and it calls for speculation. They voiced their concern at the meeting. Some did, yes. Okay. And there were about 100 people there. Yes, there were. And it was more than one hand that shot up and said, hey, what are you telling us? Do we need to go buy our own insurance? It was more than one, but I don't know the number. Okay. And you told them words to the effect of, you're not really sure you might need to do that, but as long as you're operating with our, within our policies and procedures, you should be okay. Yeah. Or words that, to that effect. Words to that effect, yes. Okay. And when you were telling them that, you also advised them that the agency, and I use you again loosely to refer sure. to the agency, would be rolling out a new set of policies and procedures and training specifically to address these issues. Yes, some, some to that effect. Okay. And, and that hopefully that would address the social workers' current concerns at that meeting about whether or not they were actually doing legal work? I don't know. Let me clarify again. Sure. Some of the information that is left out that was told you in that meeting is that I specifically stated everything that we do is geared at providing the best service we can for our children and families. All of this other stuff is secondary to that. If we're doing what we're supposed to do with our policies and procedures, we will be providing the best service possible to our children and families. That's job number one. And I didn't stutter when I said that. And then I said all that other stuff. So I guess the outfall really, what I'm looking at or looking for in my questions is the social workers that attended that meeting in May of 2011 did not have a clear understanding of how it was they were supposed to conduct their job and uh, still comply with law and not violate parents' and children's rights and get sued for it. It's a compound. I it's don't. It's vague and ambiguous and it's overbroad and it calls for speculation. I don't, I don't think that's the case at all. I think this was a verification of that. What do you mean a verification of that? A verification of the fact that they know that they're supposed to be truthful, honest, and treat families with, with uh, compassion and integrity. So why were they concerned about buying their own insurance? Because they've seen what's been happening to their peers around them and feel as though that it didn't matter if they were doing the right thing or not, that they would still be drawing or pulled into a lawsuit. But you specifically told them that their peers had done nothing wrong. Right. In that case, in Fogarty Hardwick. So I'm still not understanding if, if, they, if their peers had done nothing wrong, why would these social workers be concerned about buying their own insurance. Guess they're being overly cautious. Or maybe they're following what's the custom and practice that's generally accepted in your agency. That's, that's not. That's vague and ambiguous and it's argumentative and I don't even think it's a question, so. Is it a question? I think it's more of right? a statement. <laughs> that no. makes it a question, doesn't it? No. <laughs> have to use the restroom here if we if we're if we're about done.
Yeah, I we're think. just about done. Okay. I just went, there was one other, uh, or at least done with this line, and we'll go uh, hit the can. I got the same problem. This other document that's titled SSA Training and Career Development, you've also tagged as generally addressing the requirements that social workers need to meet in their court reporting, right? Mm -hmm. And that's that's a yes. Yes. And that general um, statement is contained on page four of this SSA training and career development document. Yes. And when was this specific document created, if you know? I do not know. I think it's fairly recent, but I don't know the exact time or date. Sometime within the last year or so? I would say so, yes. Okay. I'm not going to attach it to your deposition. It's just for my own internal okay. purposes as I go through it. <clears throat> In September of 2006, you were not the head of the entire agency, correct? That's correct. At that point in time, you were just the where'd my chart go? The director of children and family services. Yeah, director of children and family services. Thank you. That's correct. That's correct. Do you recall in 2006 the Orange County Register doing a rather inflammatory article on one of your cases? It's pagan ambiguous. Uh, it, yeah, I mean, Orange County Register does a lot of inflammatory stories about us. Which one specifically? Uh, let me just show you what will mark T as Exhibit 141 to your deposition. Hey, Sean, I think we are moving on to another area. And he indicated he needed to use oh. the restroom. If it's okay if we take a break. Yeah, that's okay. We'll give him some time to read it. Okay. We're going off the record. Time is 3.39 p.m. We're back on the record. The time is 3.49 p.m. Okay, right before we went off, we had marked as Exhibit 141 an email. Did you have a chance to look over that email? Yes. And that's an email that was sent from you? Yes. On September 20th, 2006 at 12 p.m.? Yes. And you sent it to all um, of your staff? Children and Family Services staff. Correct. What was the purpose of this email? The purpose of this email was to, um, if you will, do our own little internal editorial against what the Orange County Register had written mm -hmm. and to boost morale. Okay. And what had happened in that case was that a child had been left in uh, the parent's home and died. Correct? If I remember correctly, yes. And the Orange County Register came out with a inflammatory argument, or rather article, I'm sorry, blaming your agency and your workers. Yes. Okay. As a result of that article, your social workers uh, felt put upon. Big and ambiguous. Well, the social were obviously any time any uh, of our social workers are involved with the child death that's it's traumatic. Mm -hmm. And so you came out to reassure them that your agency did nothing wrong and that the social workers involved were not culpable in any way. That's correct. Okay. And I noticed that did not, or rather did nothing wrong is in bold, underlined, Letters? Mm -hmm. Yes? Yes. With an excl exclamation point. Right. What's the purpose of that? Again, to demonstrate to, one, um, the social worker here that she didn't do anything wrong. And also let the staff know that if you didn't do anything wrong, I will support you. However, if you do, and I said that also in that town hall meeting, then you would be disciplined and you'd be on your own. Okay. And we know of three workers in the last, I think it was four years, who had been disciplined? 
from 2012 going backwards? At least, yeah. Okay. There were three that were terminated. Okay. There's probably more that were disciplined. Okay, you're just not sure. I'm just not sure. Okay. Are you familiar with uh, Dr. Daphne Wong? Yes. How do you know her? Just through Chalk Hospital, and she is, again, one of the few board-certified child abuse physicians. Well, again, that whole board-certified thing, we, we know that that was only since 2011, right? Right, that's correct. Right. So if we're referring to Dr. Wong any time before 2011, we shouldn't be calling her a board-certified specialist in child abuse, right? That's correct. Okay, she would be a board-certified pediatrician prior right. to 2011. Right. Okay. And Daphne Wong was involved recently in another case where there was a infant death, wasn't she? I'm, I'm going to instruct him not to answer if you're going to ask him about some other case that's pending right now. I'm worried about the Kirchin case. Right. I'm going to instruct him not to answer. That's a pending case. That was a warrantless removal case, right? Instruct him not to answer. On the same, I mean, I can put my same objections that I placed before. No, I, I understand. It's the same objections that I raised earlier this morning. Okay, and in that case, the social workers, after a substantial delay from the time they discovered the family until the time they removed both children, they didn't get a warrant, did they? Instruct him not to answer. Okay. Is it your understanding that those social workers were at all time following the policies, practices, and procedures that we've been discussing here today regarding the requirements to first obtain a warrant. If we're still talking about the social workers in the Kirchner case, which is a pending matter, I will instruct him not to answer. But we are. So you instruct him. we're instructing. Okay. How about in this case with Taylor Stokes? Is it your position? Well, let me ask you this first. You spent several days preparing for your deposition here today, right? Yes. That included review of the complaint that was filed? In yes. this in this case? Yes. That included a review of all of the court reports that were filed in this case? No, I didn't review all the court reports. Did you review any of the court reports? I re reviewed the detention hearing report. Okay. Did you review the initial juvenile dependency petition that was filed? No, I just reviewed the QA report that gleaned information from that. But okay. I did not read the direct petition. Okay. What other documents besides the complaint filed in the action, the detention report, and the QA report did you review in preparation for your deposition here today? None of the, no other documents but the policies and procedures that would apply to them. Okay. And with regard to that QA report, was it necessary for you to review that report to prepare to give your deposition testimony? Did that help refresh you or? Mm -hmm. yes, yes, it was helpful. Okay, yes. and that essentially allowed you to be able to come here and talk intelligently today about this particular case? Yes. Okay. But you didn't bring that report with you? No, I did not. Do you recall us requesting copies of all documents that you reviewed in preparation for your deposition here today? Yes, I do. Is there a reason that you did not bring that particular document that you, that you reviewed in order to provide your deposition testimony here today? It's an attorney-client privilege document. So your attorney instructed you not to bring it? Yes. Okay. In reviewing and preparing for your deposition here today, did you come to the conclusion that the social worker defendants in this case were at all times following the regularly established customs, policies, and practices of your agency? From what I could ascertain, yes. Okay. I'm not going to mark this. I just want to get it clear. 
what this pile is so that my guys, when they're going back and digesting it, okay. will know what it is they're looking at. This is the email that is generated from our uh, program development unit. They're, this, they're called PDU, at least they used to be called PDU dispatches. Now it looks like they're called information updates of all the, the changes to our policies and procedures. Okay, so if I want to know, for example, when a particular policy was um, implemented, first promulgated, or changed, I would look through these emails to figure that out. When it was changed, yes. Okay, only when it was changed. Yes. It may take a while before it actually gets to Gary for signature. Got it. Okay. <clears throat> I think that deals with that issue. And there's one last thing that I found somewhat curious. And that is your 2009 business plan. Mm -hmm. Does Orange County Social Services Agency have a 2012 business plan? Um, no, it's on a two-year cycle now. Okay, what does that mean? It means we do it every two years. Okay. So we'd be doing one 2000. There should be one that's updated 2012, though. So okay. Which one is that one? Uh, it's 2009. I don't oh, see Oh, no, we have a 2012. I don't know. But maybe because it was this case was 2009, that's why we did it. But oh, we have I a 2012. Was, I got you. Okay, that's why. No, that makes sense. That okay. makes sense. And why is it that your agency formulates a business plan? From the direction of the board. The all, board. The, the board, board of supervisors. The board of supervisors. All departments. All kind of departments have to develop a business plan. Okay. And that's because the county wants the social services agency to be treated like a business, right? Right. They want accountability. Okay. Financial accountability. Financial as well as practice, and yes, mm -hmm. like a business. Right, right. And like a business, you derive revenue from different sources, including state and federal funding. Yes. And in order to obtain those financial resources from the state and federal government, your agency needs to abide by the guidelines that the state and federal governments pass out. Absolutely. Okay. And you need to meet their statistical benchmarks as well. Yes, that's okay. correct. And one of those statistics, at least insofar as it relates to children and family services, is the number of children on a year-over-year -year basis that are processed through your system. No, that's not accurate. The outcome number that we're supposed to meet, our benchmark, is to show that we're bringing in fewer kids and showing that we're having more uh, positive outcomes in regards to AB 636 outcomes that are set forth by all counties to follow. Certainly is not based upon bringing kids in, it is based upon def deferring kids, keeping kids from coming in. Okay. So am I understanding that the fewer kids that come in, the more money you get? No. Nope. So the fewer kids that come in, the less money you get? In the, in the out years, yes. So, our reimbursement is always in the rears, always in the out years. Mm -hmm. So, for example, maybe, say for example, we just got um, a payment for something that we did three years ago because okay. the state, of course, is in the condition. So, therefore, it's real complicated in regards to how they reimburse us. How, but we expend the money first, and then they reimburse us in the rears for the most part in a sure. children's program. That's not the case in Medi-Cal and CalFresh. Right. In the children's program, I, I understand that they pay you later once you report. Right, once we report. Right. That was that EA report we were looking at That earlier. was part of it, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. So once you report, then they figure out what they're going to pay you, and that check actually comes later. That's the realignment check, yes. Okay. That check, though, the size of that check, mm -hmm will be determined by the number of children that are processed through the system. The size of that check is determined by sales tax 
that the county generates. So the state and federal funding is tied to sales tax? No, that realignment piece is. That realignment piece, that realignment money goes to us and health care agency. Okay, let's exclude the realignment okay. money for just a moment. What okay. I'm concerned about is the federal and state funding that okay. you get to fund the Children and Family Services Unit. Okay. That funding, the size of that check that okay. you're going to get from either the federal or state government mm -hmm. is determined by what statistic? It's determined by caseload and staffing. So caseload is the number of kids, kids and staffing is the number of people necessary to service that number of children. Correct. For example. So have, what, wait, that's, that's correct, right? That's correct. Okay. Go, go ahead with your example. For example, it's broken out into three categories for emergency response worker. For the most part, it's one emergency response worker is to handle 15 to 20 cases per month. So that funding's based on that. One family reunification social worker is supposed to handle 20 cases, 30 cases per month. So the funding is based upon that. And then one permanency plan worker, these are social workers that work with kids that are in long-term foster care and pre-adoptive placements. Mm -hmm. It's one for every 54 kids or cases. So you see this somewhat of a comp complex sure. formula that they use. Sure. With regard to the ER worker, the emergency response worker, mm -hmm. that would be the worker that makes the initial determination whether or not to remove the child immediately. Yes. Okay. Is there any difference in funding dependent on whether the child is removed or left in the home when the ER worker goes out to do her, invest her preliminary assessment? Um, in, in one funding stream, yes. In another, no, because I'm sorry, I'd like to you. Which funding stream does it make a difference in, federal or state? Um, well, federal, it's federal and state's a combination. Okay. And what that is, for example, that would probably be more or less under the foster care because the foster care funding stream is the actual number of kids you're working with. Okay. The other one, the CWS, is it's covering staff. Okay, so one is overhead and one is, one is overhead driven, that's the one CWS. Is, one is direct care. And the other, that's the foster care, is direct care. Direct care. And in the foster care, the amount of money the county receives would be higher if the child is actually removed at the emergency mm -hmm. response yeah. stage. Because by law, they have to provide, the feds and the state have to provide funding to support that child. Right. Okay. And if the child's not removed, then you would only get CWS funding if it's like a non-removal proceeding. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, that has little impact on that. Okay. And then what about reunification, where you have a reunification situation? Is there any difference in funding there dependent on the outcome of the reunification effort? Um, only in the sense that it's uh, within the, again, the federal outcomes, or AB 636, which is California's iteration of Adoption Safe Family Act, is that we are to get kids reunified as quickly and as expeditiously as we possibly can with an 18-month cap on that. So you only get funded for 18 months of reunification efforts. Right. And after 18 months, if you're still trying to reunify, you're doing that on the county's dime. The county and the Fed still kick it, but the state no longer provides any money. Okay. But the net county net county cost increases. Okay. And then after 18 months, then we go to permanency planning, right? Right. And permanency planning is funded by who? That's still under, that's still, for the most part, it's under different, it's under, under the same umbrella, but it moves into a different realm in regards to probably when we get into more pre-adoptive services, so it might come under the adoptions funding. But there's a lot of cross train, cross work between the permanency planning worker, or I should say between the continuing worker and the permanency planning worker. Okay. So correct me if I'm wrong, but there's basically three stages at which the county for each child that, if, let's just take a uh, prototypical child that's going to go all the way through. Mm -hmm. The county gets funding first at the ER stage 
based on the removal. We're going to remove that child mm -hmm. from the home. So the county gets funding for that step. Mm -hmm. Right. And then the county would also get a bolus of funding for the overhead uh, portion of the removal that is charged the CWS. Right, for the workers who are actually doing the job. Okay. Then at the next stage, after the emergency response removal, we would go to family maintenance slash reunification. Family maintenance, right. Family maintenance or family reunification. Okay. Is there different funding for each of those, family maintenance and family reunification? It's the same. It's the same. So then the second step of funding then would be the AB 36 funding, and that would also have a federal and state component for the first 18 months. Yeah, AB 636 is all of that, actually, because it's all under the rubric of AB 636, all the way the funding okay. streams come in. Okay, what I'm really looking for is funding at each stage, so regardless of the statute that okay. enables it. I see what you're saying. We're going to get funding at the initial removal, mm -hmm. yes? Yes. Then there's also going to be a piece of funding for the CWS overhead associated yes. with that. Yes? Yes. And then there is going to be, when we move into family maintenance slash reunification, there will be funding for that effort for the first 18 months. Yes. And then if reunification is unsuccessful, we'll go to the permanency planning. Yes. And there will be another bolus of funding for that. Generally speaking, yes. That's an oversimplification, but sure. that's generally how it works. Sure. And with the permanency plan, there's a couple different ways we can go with that, right? One is adoption or guardianship or like a de facto parent status or, um, you know, a permanency plan where Orange County keeps the child, like right. in a group home or something. And we call it long-term foster care. Now, if a child goes off to adoption, for example, there's another bolus of funding that comes in for That's that. That's adoptions funding, yes. And that also has a state and federal component. Yes. And part of that funding, a portion of that goes to the general um, overhead of the agency, correct? Yes. And then a part of it would go to actually fund the foster placement. Yes, activities for that. Okay. And all of that funding at each of those stages is associated with a particular child going through that process. Yes. Okay. So as we have more children going through that process, obviously there's more funding coming in for each of them. Not necessarily. It hasn't been that way the last five years. We've taken several funding cuts, mm -hmm. but it has no impact on how many kids we serve. So the number of children coming into care has not diminished over the course of the last five years? It's been f relatively flat okay. uh, with some increases. There's another part of that that you didn't address, and that's the child abuse registry, which is initial contact mm -hmm. before the referral. Okay, and is there funding for that as well? Um, it's all a part, no. That's all a part of, I'm just saying, that's the other phase, because that's where it starts, at the child abuse registry. Okay. Is there an increase in any regard of funding where your agency is able to successfully reunify a child with its family? Meaning do you get a bonus for reunification? No, we don't get any bonuses for either it doesn't matter if the social worker sees 10 kids in a month or 20 kids in a month. It's no, no difference. Okay, so, so you're going to get funding in the same amount for each child regardless of how many children there are. Yeah, regardless of how long, yeah, regardless of how many children okay. that social worker sees, right. Okay. So the, the aggregate net amount may increase because the children increase, the number of children in increases, but the actual dollar amount per child remains constant. For the, yes, that's true. Okay. Okay, so really it is sort of like a business because you have to take all that into account. We have to, we have to take all that into account. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, your staffing levels are also driven by the number of kids you're dealing with. Absolutely. Okay. And you don't like to fire anybody, do you? Don't like to. No, not at all. Don't like to. Um, In fact, there's a, there's a union here, right? Yeah, that, and it's very difficult to fire anyone. Yeah, my mom was a uh, 
gate program administrator for San Diego City Schools, and she, had, she couldn't get rid of anybody. It's very difficult. Yeah. People wouldn't even show up to work, and she couldn't do anything it's, about it. Yeah, that's yeah. a whole nother Yeah, a whole nother discussion. topic. <laughs> 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 but realistically, um, in all seriousness, the social workers that you deal with, they are union members. Yes, they are. And you can't just walk in one day and say, you're fired because we don't have money for you. No, I can't. Yeah. They have an MOU. The bargaining unit has an MOU, Memorandum of Understanding, mm -hmm. with the Board of Supervisors that the Board of Supervisors agrees to that we have, meaning department heads, have no say in whatsoever. Right. We just have to follow whatever they agree to. Right. And as the agency grows and as its employment numbers, as its head, you're really pretty hamstrung in dealing with that growth. You just have to do whatever it is the Board signed you up for. That's correct. Okay. And if your funding shrinks, for example, that's, you're just stuck with that's it. too bad, yes. Okay. I think, uh, I think I'm done. Okay, great. See, 4.15. All right. I can still get home before I usually do 7 o'clock, so that's a good thing. Yeah, that is a good thing. This is the same stipulation? Though. Yeah, we'll step on this. I just don't step on doctors. What is this? Uh, what? Go ahead and I'll make sure that I agree. <laughs> Stipulate to relieve the court reporter of her duties under the code that she will cause the original of this transcript to be prepared and forwarded to my office. Within 30 days of transmission of the transcript, I'll arrange to have Dr. Riley review the transcript, make any changes he deems necessary, sign the transcript of under penalty of perjury, also within 30 days of transmission of the transcript to my office. I will notify all counsel in this case of the nature and extent of any changes that Dr. Riley makes to the transcript and of the fact that he signed the transcript under penalty of perjury. My office will maintain custody and control of the original of this transcript. If the original is lost, the original of this transcript is lost or destroyed or unavailable for any reason, a certified copy can be used as though it were a signed original. Um, I will make the transcript available for uh, uh, hearings or trial upon reasonable request. And a certified original can be, yeah, a certified copy can be used as an original in any event, whether it's lost, whether the original is lost, stolen, destroyed, or whatever. Except to the extent that it may be modified by whatever changes I notify of everybody. Well, we're going to use the video anyway. I mean, if he modifies it, he's going to be called to answer in front of the jury on his modification. I'm not going to be stuck with that modification. I won't stick to that. No, except to the extent if he does make a modification because of a clerical error or a misprint. No, we're, we're going to use, use it as we would per, be permitted to use it under code, irrespective of whether he modifies okay. it. Okay, well, you're going to be stuck with whatever modifications I notify you of, so well, that's the stipulation. No, the stipulation is going to be... You can ask him about no, it, No, the stipulation is going to be that we'll go by code, we'll use the... Original deposition is we're entitled to use it at trial in the event that it's not produced at trial the video will suffice and um, The certain. only the only ex copy. the only exception is going to be that you get to get the original maintain it transmit it to him If he makes any changes, you'll let me know. I'll let you know and you can use a certified <clears throat> copy if the original is unavailable I'm just saying no, I'm going to use a certified copy whether it's available or not I'm not sure I understand you, nor do I believe the court would allow you to do that. Well, the, the, court original will, is available. the court will let us do anything we step to. If the original is available, no. All right, we'll I'm not, by code. I'm not going to do an original. No, we're not going to do it by code. Yeah, I, well, we're not, we're you're, gonna you're either going to do it the, the way I want to do it so that I'm not stuck with whatever changes happen and that you'll get to comment on those when you redirect them, but I'm not going to step to something that any, in any way impinges my ability to use the unadulterated transcript that I get today or tomorrow or whenever it's produced. Okay. That's different than any stipulation we've entered into in this, in this case, including I, your own clients. So I why, agree. So why would that be fair? Because and if you it's, it's if not even and an if issue you're of gonna, And if you're going to make this witness go to San Diego to sign this, I will go to Judge Stock on that. And I'll point out that you've been doing it to other witnesses in this case. Is and I'll that point a threat? Out that you've done it. Dude, that, if it's a that, problem, don't threaten me. Go do it. That, that I don't you, take... Whoa, whoa, hold up. I do not take kindly to threats. If you're going to go to Judge Stock on something, do it. Okay. Do not ever threaten me. Let's 
be gentlemanly then and enter into a normal stipulation the like stipulation, we have with every the other stipulation, witness in this case. I, I mean, one at a time to be captured on the record. The stipulation I'm willing to enter into is that I may use and treat the certified copy as an original for all purposes, period. I don't even understand what that means. I mean, if the original is well, available... If you don't understand what it means, then we have a problem stipping. Why, why would the... If the original is available, why would you use a certified copy? Because I'm going to use my certified copy. But I don't understand why you wouldn't use the original. Because it's, it's convenient to me. I have the certified copy. You can either step or not. If you're not going to step, then we'll go by code. And okay. You can do whatever you're going to Here, do. Here's it. what I propose. If the court will allow you to do that... The court will allow me to do anything we step to. No, that's not true. I've been in front of judges that will not allow With, anything other than the original transcript unless the parties represent that the original has been destroyed. So well, the, court, the court's not going to just let you do anything that we step to. With regard to the treatment of the transcript, she is going to let us treat it as an original. I guarantee it. Okay. Every other judge I've ever been in front of at trial well, has no problem with that. I, I would allow you to use the certified transcript as though it were an original, although I'm reserving this witness's right to review it, sure. make any changes that he deems necessary, and we'll notify you of that. And if you choose to ignore whatever changes there are, are in your use of the transcript, we sure. can comment on that. Sure, and I'll okay. comment on whatever changes he makes. Okay. I'm fine with that. Okay. Isn't this great? <laughs> okay, so for the recorder, the original it goes is to going me. to you. It goes to me. Yeah. Okay. And who needs a rough draft? Not me. Needs, I mean, a rough draft. Okay. All right. Thank you. This concludes today's deposition. We're off the record at 4.18 p.m. <laughs>